So Aloha will be starting in about five minutes. Uh, this is just a test. Thank you. Okay, we're going to start in about 30 seconds, so if you can make yourselves comfortable. Seats, obviously. Welcome and aloha to the Fuel Tank Advisory Committee meeting. 
Thank you all for being here today and for those who are attending um, virtually. I'd like to thank, I'd like to especially thank those who participated in last night's open house, especially the Sierra Club of Hawaii, the Oahu Water Protectors, Board of Water Supply. Mahalo for your collaboration and your advocacy. This new, form, new format is part of our work to ensure that the public has access to information and can question and can ask questions directly to the Navy and regulators. DOH's mission is to protect public health and the environment and for all people uh, in Hawaii. Regarding Red Hill, we have three priorities. Defuel and close the Red Hill tanks quickly and safely as possible and to remediate our aquifer. Defueling removes the risk of further contamination. Closure removes the risk of future contamination and remediation ensures safe drinking water for future generations. Today, we will hear updates on these three priorities. You will have an opportunity to ask questions and provide your thoughts on this work. We appreciate your continued feedback and advocacy on Red Hill issues. Working together, we will all accomplish these three priorities and protect our natural resources. I look forward to a productive conversation. Mahalo. Um, the other part of this is that DOH has uh, the purpose of FTAC is found in your um, agenda. It was created by statute under 342HL42. Um, now to begin, I would like to call the roll. My name is Kathleen Ho. I'm the chair of FTAC. I'm the deputy director for environmental health with the Department of Health. Uh, Carlos Santana, who is with uh, Senator Maisie Hirono. Kaleo Manuel is not present. Um, Ernest Lau from the Board of Water Supply. Claire Tomador from EPA. Dr. Melanie Nau, who is a public member. And Kaleo, thank you for coming. Um, and Ashley Nishihara, who is also a public member. Thank you very much for coming. And with that, I'll turn it over to you. Aloha. So my name is Keith Matson. I'm the facilitator for today's meeting. Um, and I want to uh, take a few minutes to just kind of walk through the format, the setting, what to expect. Uh, and then we will, uh, before the, um, we will have the speakers on this side, which are many, introduce themselves later when they first uh, present to you. They'll do self-introductions. So um, FTAC has uh, had uh, meetings over the past, uh, I guess, six, seven, eight years. And last year, if you recall, if you had attended any of them or read about them, uh, they tended to be very long. And uh, in many respects, I think uh, they, they were frustrating uh, because there was so much information, but also the public was you know, clamoring for a chance for input. We purposely altered the format for this particular meeting to try to do a few things. One, to make the presentations you'll hear much shorter, much more succinct. And they're sort of executive summary versions of what uh, is much more detailed information that you'll find online. And I hope everybody had a chance to look at that. Um, the other thing is that um, most of our participants today are um, on Zoom in the Zoom webinar format. Um, we're used to doing Zooms, all of us, uh, but uh, in this case, we're trying to deliver a very high quality, immersive experience in a hybrid format. And I have to thank uh, the people who helped make this possible. Uh, first of all, uh, a very big thank you to Moana Lua High School for allowing us to use this wonderful new uh, performing arts center. To the Alelo Broadcasting Group, who is uh, providing the Zoom feed that you are seeing, the video part of it, 
Um, and it's the same thing as they are showing on Channel 49. And uh, finally, uh, the uh, University of Hawaii's Information Technology Services Group, which is uh, doing the Zoom webinar hosting. We're very hopeful that this will be a high quality experience for you. Keep in mind, please, though, that um, it's kind of newish for us to be stitching all this together. And we may uh, experience some pickups, but uh, I beg that you um, have some patience with that. Um, what I want to do is walk through a little bit of the goals for today's meeting. So if I can have that slide up, please. And for those on uh, uh, Zoom, uh, and uh, Alelo, you will not see me when I'm saying this, you're going to see the slide. But once we're back to you know the audio part of the program, me talking or whatever, you will see uh, the speakers. So today, what we want to try to do is really try to focus on the near-term tasks and developments. And because we're having, I guess, a more focused agenda, it allows us to, to concentrate more on the near-term things like defueling, uh, the decisions that have to be made about closure, and the ongoing work about remediation. There are some other things as well on the agenda. But you know what FTAC, I think, really is uh, the heart and soul of it is to try to enhance our collective understanding and awareness of everything going on, both now and uh, in the future. One thing I, uh, I would really emphasize for everybody, whether you're here in the audience or uh, online or even here uh, on stage speaking, is to try to share the airspace. A lot of us have things we want to say. Try to be um, direct, if you can, uh, so that we can hear as many voices as possible. It's very easy to make very uh, important points in a relatively short period of time. And finally, just strive for constructive dialogue. Uh, this is an issue that I think has really been a difficult one um, for all of us in Hawaii. And there are a lot of, um, there's a lot of history to it. But if we can strive for that increased understanding and constructive dialogue, I think we will make this type of event and other types of engagement that much better. Let's set, uh, go to the next slide, please. So this is the agenda in brief. Um, We've almost gone through the opening remarks. Pretty soon we'll go into the presentations that I mentioned before. Then we're going to take a 10 minute break uh, about halfway through three o'clock. And uh, at that point, we're going to pivot to the uh, questions and answers from the audience. We'll have two microphones stationed down here at the front, and uh, we will be uh, taking questions from the Zoom uh, webinar participants as well at that time. Um, we will go through you know, more detailed instructions, uh, but if you are in the audience today here in person, remember we asked you to sign up on the sheet in the front if you intend to ask a question or make a comment. If you haven't done that already, I would highly encourage you to do so now. Um, and when we get to the break, the Zoom webinar attendees will be able to raise their digital hand and they will be uh, up in the queue in the order that they raise their hand. Um, we will be taking uh, questions and comments for a two minute uh, period per person. We ask that you kindly to make sure that you're sharing the airspace with all the others who, who do want to speak. Um, one thing to keep in mind, too, is um, sometimes somebody has asked the question that you had in mind, and uh, there you are, you got your spot. I would highly encourage you to maybe think of one or two backup questions uh, rather than repeat the question that they asked, because you're not going to get a different answer, but also that you don't want to miss your chance to be able to ask. So uh, maybe line up one or two uh, or even three in your own minds. Okay. Okay. Um, Let's uh, go to uh, the next slide, please. And this is for our uh, Zoom webinar uh, participants. Um, so you are seeing the same video feed as the television broadcast. And so at times it will show the speakers and at times it will show the full uh, PowerPoint uh, slides up there. Um, and we will be using several different camera angles, so I hope you'll be able to have a, a fairly rich experience with that. Um, the chat is enabled for those who are on Zoom. It's not visible uh, for the TV audience or in person here. Um, 
And uh, let's see, when we, uh, again, when we get to the uh, public question and comment period, uh, you'll be invited in the order that you um, raised your hand to, to unmute and speak. Um, let's go to the very last slide in my overview. And, you know, these are, I think, simple, respectful ground rules that hopefully everybody uh, will, will welcome. Um, if we can strive for brevity and conciseness, uh, you know, there's a lot uh, that, as I said, that can be said in a relatively short period of time. Civility and courtesy is always, you know, highly encouraged and, and you know, expected, I think, uh, because we're, we are a very civil society. And so um, even if passions and disagreement run high, I highly encourage you, you can ask tough questions in a, in a respectful and civil way. You can ask very tough questions as, you, as everybody knows. And finally, your cuckoo and patience, uh, not only with all of us in the room, but with this new format. We really want to try to give this new format a chance to succeed. And if we have hiccups, um, please ride them out with us. Okay, so um, that is all I wanted to go over for the meeting format. Let's go to the next slide because um, we're going to get into the first sort of information item. Um, and this has to do with uh, Red Hill public engagement. Uh, last year, I think there was relatively not so much engagement. This year, I think you've seen there already is a lot more. And those are the different forums that we're, we're seeing already, open houses like the one back in, uh, in January uh, or the one that the Navy recently held uh, for defueling, town halls likewise. Uh, we had an open house just last night uh, here at the cafeteria. Webinars, uh, there's a, a series of those that have already been produced and many more will be on the way. Um, if you are following Red Hill Things online, you'll see there's a lot more information uh, coming out and including some very novel and I think uh, helpful applications to look at uh, groundwater testing results. Uh, there are two sites for that. Um, and finally, the FTAC meetings. I lay all this out because this allows meetings like this one to be more focused and not the only opportunity that is around for a dialogue about FTAC. And later on in the meeting, uh, the EPA is going to talk about yet another brand new uh, mechanism for public engagement uh, that they are planning and developing. Next slide, please. So um, another thing to help you keep track of all these things uh, is there's a collective calendar uh, that has been posted on the EPA website. The QR code is there on the screen. And if you uh, pull that up, you will see all the events that are scheduled for Red Hill in the coming months. Um, this happens to be the more detailed one about today's event. Uh, but you know, uh, check on that uh, for updates. Uh, and uh, you'll be able to see over time a, pa uh, a, a more full, robust schedule of events such as this. I'm going to pause here first, and I want to turn to the FTAC members to see if you have any questions at this point about just what I covered with, in particular, the Red Hill public engagement, the different types of, um, of formats. Ashley. Oh, okay. This is on. Okay. Uh, this is just to clarify, you know, the public engagement calendar. Will this calendar have every uh, upcoming event regarding uh, Red Hill listed? So I've noticed it includes events by the Navy and DOH. Would it also include any events like if it were hosted by the Board of Water Supply as well? Okay. Um, who would like to take that from our speakers, Kathy or Allison? I can take that question. Thanks. So hi, everyone. Allison Fong here from the EPA. Um, to answer that question, currently the, the calendar, which was launched in May, does include events from EPA, DOH, Navy, Joint Task Force, Red Hill. But if there are additional public events um, that we'd want to post here, we would, we would welcome that. We want this to be a single resource of all the public engagement opportunities, so we'd welcome those to be added to the calendar. Please get in touch with us. Kathy. Hi, thank you. I, I'm sorry. I... Um, in my call of role for the FTAC members, I failed to call a few people. So um, also present is uh, uh, Rear Admiral 
Barnett from the Pacific Fleet, Fleet is the, who is the designee for the commander in Navy Region Hawaii. Um, online would be uh, Senator Mike Gabbard and uh, Representative Nicole Lowen. Uh, Ryan Imada also from the, is also online from the Department of Land and Natural Resources. Um, he represents the groundwater regulation. Um, and also David Taga is also present. Okay, thank you for that update. And those um, members of the committee, you may see them drop uh, on the big screen uh, when they want to participate in the meeting, ask a question. Okay, Ernie. Uh, thank you, our Ernie uh, from the Board of Water Supply. Um, mahalo for this great venue and mahalo to uh, Mauna Loa High School for allowing us to use this beautiful uh, performing arts center. Uh, if I can make a suggestion, thank you, EPA, for hosting the engagement calendar. Uh, I think I brought this up before, but maybe if you don't mind going maybe a little step further with that um, to actually try to host a website that people can go to a single website and be directed to connect to uh, Admiral Wade's web website or Admiral Barnett's website or the Department of Health, Solid and Hazardous Waste or Safe Drinking Water Branch or Red Hill websites or the water supply websites. So it's easier, like a gateway into all this information that exists in different stakeholders. So that's my recommendation or request. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Any other uh, uh, questions from the FTAC members uh, before we move on? Okay, very good then. So we're going to go right into you know some of the more substantive aspects of the uh, agenda, and I would like to turn it over to uh, Admiral Wade uh, from the Joint Task Force to uh, do number three, the defueling update. Admiral Wade. Okay, uh, thank you, sir. Appreciate it, and uh, good afternoon, Ms. Ho, FTAC members, and distinguished uh, members of the community. Uh, my name is Vice Admiral John Wade. And I'm the commander of Joint Task Force Red Hill. Uh, what I intend to do is uh, cover two slides. And uh, the purpose of my briefing here today will provide an overview of our mission, just for those that may not be aware of what the task force is assigned to do. And then give a high level overview of our timeline of the tasks that we're uh, tasked to do. And then stand by for any questions and have a, a dialogue with you. So if we can just go to the next slide, please. Okay, so um, Joint Task Force Red Hill was established to safely and ex expeditiously defuel the Red Hill facility and to also rebuild trust with the people of Hawaii, our elected officials, our interagency partners as well. Uh, defueling, as the Secretary of Defense has said, is the absolute right thing to do for the people of Hawaii, for our military families, for the environment, and for national security. Uh, Joint Task Force, Red Hill, my team, we are singularly focused on this mission. We understand the enormity of it, and we're honored to support the community and the people of Hawaii to get this done as quickly as possible. If you look at the bottom of the slide, I often tell people that there's a technical aspect to the, to the mission. That's to conduct this mission deliberately, methodically. I've said this before, to spill not one drop, but then there's also the art of the mission to, to listen, to hear the community, to understand what you have been through, through all these years, and to also realize that it's concrete action, not words, that will even go towards starting to heal some of the, the concerns that you have, which are valid. And I appreciate the opportunity to be able to, to do that with you. The Secretary of Defense in March of 22 made the decision to defuel and close the facility. And in June of 2022, the Secretary of Defense tasked U.S. Indo-Pacific Command to take the defueling mission. This is the most urgent part to remove the threat above the aquifer. 
And in July of 2022, Amalek Alino, the commander of US Indo-Pacific Command, decided that he was gonna create a task force to operationalize the mission. I was one of several joint officers that were in consideration for this job. At the end of August of 2022, I was humbly selected. Middle of September, we started building the team. On the 30th of September, we formulated the team and we assumed control and ownership of the Department of Defense defueling plan on September 30th. I had the opportunity to brief the FTAC in early November. And in doing so, I highlighted that in taking the ownership of that plan, that the defueling would start in February of 2024 and complete by June of 2024. And that I also promised to build a schedule and then to work in partnership, but within state and federal laws to see what we can do to move faster. In other words, hopefully to start to fueling earlier because for every day that this fuel remains above the aquifer is a threat to the community and to our environment. My team and I immediately did in engineering terms what's called a requirements traceability assessment. We looked at the state emergency order. We looked at the then consent order from 2015. We looked at the orders that were given to me by the Secretary of Defense and laying out all the requirements, we then built a schedule that adhered to the current defueling plan. And then we worked to look at adjacencies, dependencies, and efficiencies to see if we could move faster, but do so safely. If we can move to the next slide. I recognize here that the screen is not uh, big enough, so you can't really see this. Uh, but what, what this is, is a high level overview of our, what's called integrated master schedule. And what this does is that it shows that our intentions are to start gravity defueling on an accelerated timeline, and we project, project a mid-October start. Now, this is what's called conditions-based. Conditions-based means that things need to be in order and safe. And so a couple of examples are that we still require approvals from the Department of Health and the EPA. They hold us to a standard. That's the right thing to do. All the equipment needs to work so that we can execute deliberately and methodically, and most importantly, safely. We need to have stable infrastructure support, think power and water, uh, and then also we must complete the NEPA, which is a uh, National Environmental Protection Act requirements, but we are on plan right now to start our gravity defueling on 16 October. We released an updated defueling plan on the 16th of May. This defueling plan is found on the EPA website. It's also on the DOH website. It's on our website. We also have a new app and it provides a detailed roadmap, a timeline for the work that we must accomplish, all the responsibilities, the approvals, the safety requirements for each step. And I would highly, highly uh, and respectfully recommend that the community look at this document. It's detailed and it will tell you what we're doing and why and how we're going about to do it and what we are doing to mitigate risk every step of the way. Now, I wanna be clear uh, and upfront that the Department of Defense intends to remove every last drop of fuel out of the facility, every last drop. But this plan that we have presented is just one phase of many phases to get that last drop. This plan from October through January is what we can remove from the facility using gravity as our force to remove the fuel. And in doing so, we will remove a little over 104 million gallons or 99.85% of what is in the facility. There will be what we estimate 
at the end of this phase, about 100 to 400,000 gallons of fuel remaining. And those pockets of fuel will be in low point drains, in bends in the pipelines. Uh, some fuel could be behind valves. While we've been doing our repairs, we have found pockets of fuel because of sediment that is built up over 80 years of the facility. The pipelines have settled over 80 plus years. So there are sags in the line and there's a little fuel there. So the Department of Defense is actively working on a detailed plan right now so that when we complete the gravity draining, what we will need to do to get after that last drop. But I wanna make sure that it's clear to everyone being transparent, honest, uh, that we will remove most, but not all the fuel, but we uh, will not stop with the guidances to safely defuel and get rid of the fuel as expeditiously as possible. And that's absolutely, absolutely critical. Uh, what I'll do now is uh, I'll pause here to answer questions and uh, look forward to uh, a dialogue. And uh, again, thank you for the opportunity to give you this update. So I'm standing by. Thank okay. you. Thank you, Admiral Wright. Before we go to uh, questions, I wanted to uh, turn it over to Joanna Cito from the Department of Health, and I believe Allison Fong, who will talk a little bit about the combined Department of Health and EPA oversight for defueling. Joanna? Or... Um, hi, okay. my name is Amy Miller, and I'm the Director of the Enforcement Compliance Assurance Division at EPA. Region 9, and I am here with Allison Fong, who, who also works at EPA, uh, and Joanna uh, from Department of Health and myself are going to give an update on EPA and Department of Health's oversight of defueling. Next slide. Thank you. The Department of Health regulates Hawaii's underground storage tanks, also known as USTs, under the authority of Hawaii Revised Statutes, Chapter 342L, and Hawaii Administrative Rules, Chapter 11-280.1. In addition to the statutes and rules, the Red Hill Bulk Fuel Storage Facility is regulated by the Department's May 6, 2022 emergency order. This past Friday, June 2nd, EPA, signed, EPA and the Navy uh, signed the 2023 consent order with uh, the Defense Logistics Agency that covers defueling and closure of the Red Hill Bulk Fuel Storage Facility. The 2023 closure, sorry, 2023 consent order provides EPA with an enforceable role to ensure the removal of fuel and closure of the tanks and associated infrastructure. EPA's regulatory authority extends to the spill prevention, control, and countermeasures and facility response plan programs as well as assistance and oversight of the department's UST programs. Together, these authorities create a strong framework to enforce our priority to quickly and safely defuel Red Hill. Next slide, please. The department's emergency order requires the submittal of a phased plan for defueling and permanently closing the Red Hill UST facility. As you can see on this slide, the department's review of sections of the defueling phase of the closure plan have been either completed, conditionally reviewed, or con conditionally approved, continued review, or pending receipt of the submittal from Joint Task Force Red Hill. Reviewing in sections allows multiple tasks to occur concurrently, expedites review, and keeps the defueling project on schedule. Next slide. Okay, so under the authority of the 2023 consent order, EPA will have a formal role in overseeing defueling. This will allow the agency to review, provide feedback, and approve the defueling plan and supplemental submissions. Not only does EPA review the defueling plan, but reviews all joint task force deliverables. Once approved by EPA, we will require the Joint Task Force to abide by the approved defueling plan as submitted. EPA will ultimately need to review and approve a defueling preparedness report, which must include the items 
you see on the screen. Joint task force must defuel the facility following the approval of this report. Next slide. EPA, Department of Health, and the Joint Task Force continue to coordinate every day to ensure preparation for defueling. EPA and DOH meet with the Joint Task Force weekly um, at the defueling working group technical meeting. Commonly, um, uh, most of the time, they uh, have topic-specific meetings uh, to reach resolution on specific issues and regularly engage um, at a senior leadership level. The regulatory agencies will continue to have on-site presence during significant milestones to ensure work is performed according to the plans submitted by the Joint Task Force. This will be especially true during the defueling of the main tanks, when we will place an emphasis on putting boots on the ground uh, to witness Joint Task Force moving fuel from these tanks. Constant engagement has prepared EPA and the Department of Health to respond swiftly to any unforeseeable changes to the proposed schedule. Next slide. Since mid-May of this year, the regulatory agencies have been reviewing and preparing comments on Supplement 2 of the defueling plan. We are reviewing this plan to make sure it appropriately involves regulators and establishes realistic and optimistic timelines for finishing work. We're also reviewing the many quality validation reports that are submitted monthly, ensuring that the work is checked before being cleared and approved. Finally, the regulatory agencies have and will continue to review and comment on the JTF concept of operations, con ops, and operations orders, op orders, which provide a rich enough count of where and how fuel will move. The regulatory agencies review and ensures that yet another set of eyes is reviewing this work to make sure the GTF is adequately prepared for defueling. Thank you. Great. Thank you all for uh, nice, concise presentations and information. And again, there's more online. So let's go straight to our uh, FTAC members uh, with any questions they have. I'll uh, call you first, Ashley. Hi, uh, this question is for Vice Admiral Wade. Um, and the last time I said this question, it was in the FTAC meeting just before the spill that sickened uh, thousands of people in, in Navy base. So what is the Navy's plan if the worst case scenario happens and there's a catastrophic release of fuel? Thank you for, thank you for the question. Let me just make sure, uh, clarify, the Joint Task Force is responsible for the defueling. So if there was a spill, the Joint Task Force would be responsible for uh, taking immediate and controlling actions. So um, what I'd like to do first is to step back and tell you what we've done to reduce risk to prevent a spill, and then to then specifically ask you, answer your question. So, <clears throat> We had the May and the November spills of 2021. Uh, very unfortunate uh, and preventable uh, incidents. There have been investigations. We've scoured those investigations for the lessons learned, and we've incorporated those lessons learned into what we call concept of operations and our procedures. One of the lessons from the May and the November spills is that the procedures that were in place were not as thorough as they should have been. The other thing that we have been doing with the development of these more detailed procedures is having a third party engineering firm review who has industry standards and experience to help us and to ensure that we haven't missed anything. And then all these procedures are forwarded to the Department of Health and the EPA and their engineers to review. So there's multiple layers of review to ensure that we're uncovering any issues, any blind spots, again, to reduce risk to the greatest extent possible. And then, ma'am, what we're also doing is training. And we're doing a lot of training at the individual level and then also at the team level. 
And we, we've done two major evolutions following this model. We conducted unpacking in the fall where we removed a little over a million gallons from the pipelines to then allow us to do the repairs in the facility. And most recently we conducted dewatering where we removed water from the tanks, the 14 active tanks or tanks that have fuel in it. And then also conducted fuel samples. You may recall that after the 21 spills during a dewatering evolution, there was yet another spill. And I would argue that that event is what led to the changing of the defueling mission to be in the operational chain of command and the establishment of the joint task force. So there's a methodical deliberate approach to reduce risk while we're conducting this very complex and dangerous evolution. So let, let's just, I wanted to make sure that, that we knew that. So yes, there is a chance that there could be another spill. And we are working with the regulators as mandated in the emergency order to have response plans. And we've, we've characterized response plans as a most likely, and it doesn't mean it's gonna happen, but if we were gonna have a valve that failed or a, a pipeline crack, uh, then either during repacking or during the main uh, tank draining, the scenario could happen, and then we build a plan for it, and then we train to it. So in the defueling supplement, there are seven scenarios that we've submitted to the regulators for their review that is part of their review that they're doing right now, and we're parallel training to it. So if we had a spill during the main tank, uh, there are what's called sumps. Sumps are cavities that collect fluid. And inside those cavities, there's pumps. And we will use those pumps to then remove the fluid and to move it into one of the storage tanks. And we do it as quickly as possible because we know that the tunnel is porous with cement. And we've got to move that fuel out of there as quickly as possible to ensure that we have the least amount of fuel that would then penetrate through the concrete into the lava rock and then potentially into the aquifer. If the amount of fuel is so significant that we can't capture it all in the sumps in the vicinity of the underground or the underground tanks, then fuel will continue through the tunnel. And we have a series of uh, what's called diverting structures that will ensure that uh, the fuel is diverted away from the uh, Red Hill well and continue down the harbor tunnel towards the underground pump house. We also have worked with the regulators and looked at every crack, every penetration in the tunnel. We've sealed them. We've put rubber gasket material, sandbags. We have uh, uh, spill kits. We will have people, rovers with radios, we will have cameras. We're doing everything possible to reduce risk. And if the amount of fuel is significant enough that it then gets down to the underground pump house, we are installing multiple high uh, capacity pumps that will collect before it leaves the underground pump house. And then we will pump that fuel to the tanker that will be at one of the fueling piers. And if any of the fuel gets past those pumps and gets into the harbor, we've got booms and skimmers and we have uh, a whole defense in depth, so to speak, plan that we would address that fuel as quickly as possible. Now, everything that I've just described, we're testing to make sure that they work. We're training to it, tabletop exercises, rehearsals, and we are required by the emergency order and from your consent order to conduct drills and get graded on them and be certified by the regulators before we can execute. So a lengthy question, but an important question for the community to understand that we're doing everything possible to prevent an incident. But if we do, uh, we have measures to uh, attack it as quickly as possible and that we're ready. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, we're going to go first to Senator Mike Gabbard, who had his hand up a few minutes ago, and then we'll go directly to you, Dr. Lau. 
So, Senator Gabbard? Yes, my question also is for uh, Vice Admiral uh, Wade. Uh, Admiral, you mentioned that the you're going to begin October 16th and you plan to finish in January and that there will be approximately 100 million gallons left and you're going to be using the gravity method starting October 16th. What Can you describe what you use after that to get that residue of 100 million gallons and how long it will take to actually get rid of all of that? Thank you for the question. The, um, we estimate that the amount of fuel remaining in the facility after we conduct gravity draining will be between 100 and 400,000 gallons, not a million. Uh, so I just want to make sure that uh, we're clear on that. Now, I do admit that that's a substantial amount of fuel. So I don't want to under, uh, underestimate the, the importance. We understand how significant it is. It's much larger than the amount of fuel that was spilled in November. So I don't want people to think that I'm flippant at all, but I, it's a physics problem. We can't get the fuel out by gravity draining. So what we need to do is we need a methodical, deliberate approach where we've got to systematically go through each of the low point drains, the bends, and we also have to inspect every valve, but I want to make sure that everyone understands the enormity of this. There's about 100 low point drains. There are three and a half miles of pipeline within the facility. There's close to 2,000 valves. So we've got, to, we've got to approach this systematically and delicately. We can't nonchalantly do this. When we completed unpacking, the removal of the fuel in the pipelines and started our mandatory repairs. We went in with the guidance and the assumption that we had fuel everywhere just to ensure that we were safe. And we did find pockets of fuel. And I'll just give you one example. We found fuel behind a valve that was installed over 40 years ago. And when we started measuring back, we, we we wanted to make sure that it wasn't growing and it wasn't. So we knew that we didn't have a leak. And then when we did the calculations, we determined that there was 14,000 gallons of fuel that was dammed behind this valve, which we believe was because of sediment that has created over 80 years of fuel operations. We then worked with the DOH and the EPA to let them know immediately that we found it and that we needed to come up with a plan to remove that fuel. We then came up with our plan. They reviewed it, they approved it, but then we had to file, follow all environmental laws. There was lead and we had to do lead abatement. There was asbestos, we had to clear that. And then we had to methodically remove that fuel with primary and secondary containment. We had to have response plans. It took us 14 weeks to remove that 14,000 gallons behind one valve. So, that's what we may have to contend with when we unpack, or excuse me, when we finish our defueling and we finish the unpacking, there may be residual fuel and we'll have to work that deliberately and we'll be transparent. But, uh, you know, that's, that's what we need to do. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dr. Lau. Okay, thank you. Um, I hate to say this, but we're not really gonna follow the agenda if we keep this up. So I'm gonna actually consolidate my questions so both of you can think about at the same time. Admiral Wade, um, actually this is for the Department of Health. Who is the third party that the Department of Health EPA is using to validate your findings? Your plans sound great, but they're only gonna be as good as the person looking at them and critiquing them to make sure the upgrades, the changes, the repairs, the procedures, the drills are actually going to be safe. I'm not sure if EPA or DOH takes that question. That's one question. The other one, um, this one goes to EPA, is now, thank you for, one of my questions was to know whether that order was really signed. So that 2023 consent order is in effect now, correct? Okay, so how good, how strong is the enforcement arm of the EPA to be able to actually hold them accountable? Because I have to say in the past, it was not very good. And I'm afraid most of us reading it this time also does not feel there's much 
behind it, especially in terms of like even penalties. So both questions, thank you. Uh, those are questions I think for the regulators. So I'll, I'll... Well, uh, the Department of Health has in-house review, but we also hired a contractor, Tetra Tech, uh, who's our engineering firm who will be reviewing um, those those plans as well. Dr. Lau, this is Allison Fong from the EPA. So to answer your first question, um, EPA has tapped uh, expertise from across our different programs, um, both underground storage tanks, uh, subject matter experts, as well as spill response subject matter experts and facility response plan expertise within in-house. We also have contractor support um, from the uh, tank expert that we've engaged since the beginning of uh, the 2015 AOC is a nationally recognized uh, tank expert infrastructure contractor who supports us in reviewing what the, the Joint Task Force submits. Do you have the specific contractor in mind? I don't know this, but I'm sure there's people out there who would be able to independently corroborate that these people know what they're doing um, and we can trust them. Sure. We should yeah. put EPA, it up on your EPA, EPA site or firm something. Is the, the Penny Consulting Firm. I'm sorry. Penny, P E M Y Consulting. Okay, well, if you know, could you put it up on your site and Tetra Tech as well? Um, you know, everybody's got a bio up there now. Maybe it'd be good to have a bio on these companies. Um, I did, I'm sorry, I had one more question for Dr. Buss for um, Admiral Wade. When you said every last drop that needs to be defueled, we talked about this before. There's gravity flow, most of that's going to go that way. The extra 100 to 400,000 is probably just an inch, inch deep in all of the tanks. And then there's probably sludge left. To me, sludge is also fuel. I hate to add to your mission, but I don't think the defueling is done until the sludge is out as well, because it's going to take a long time to get around to the closure. And I don't want that sludge sitting there. So can you comment on how that's gonna come out before your defueling mission is done? So uh, sludge is certainly a hazardous material. It's partially solid, part, partially liquid. Uh, in industry standards, it's not considered fuel, but it needs to be removed, absolutely. Uh, so the removal of sludge will take a significant amount of time. That is why the sludge is part of the closure plan, because it will, it, it's got to go from tank to tank. So. Emma Barnett is more qualified to answer that because that is already part of the defense plan is to, to include that enclosure. Uh, but uh, you're absolutely right. We've, we've got to get every bit of fuel. It's all dependent on the sequencing of the removal of the pipelines and where we will find the pockets of fuel. We're doing surveys right now. So there's a, there's a lot of work still to be done and I appreciate your concern. Okay, thank you. So, um, oh, did you want to follow up? Yeah, I, I wanted to follow up on your, your question concerning enforcement. So uh, first off, um, with this agreement, um, we have learned a lot from the 2015 agreement and we have made some modifications to the agreement to strengthen it. Uh, it does have stipulated penal, penal, penalties. In addition, um, we are having more frequent senior level uh, in, uh, meetings and, and, and engagements to help resolve issues. And the last thing I wanted to mention is the management of the order um, is within the enforcement division. That's my, my division, and that is our bread and butter. We enforce regulations. The 2015 order uh, was originally in our um, land division who oversees technical work. And because of the importance of needing to have an, enforce, an enforcement order um, that is enforced, um, we will be managing the enforcement of this order. Okay, great. And we're just a little over time, but Ernie, I wanna recognize you for your question. Yeah, thank you, uh, Keith. Uh, uh, Admiral Wade, thank you. Can you. Could you bring back the slide with the uh, schedule on it? Thank you. Uh, so my question is, um, I notice on that schedule, if you look under that first row, which is called plans, uh, there's a decision point 
uh, basically it relates to tankers, October start. That looks like to me that you're gonna put in the order for tankers to come in October, but you have to put that order in basically at the end of the month, uh, end of this month. Uh, it's a great question. Uh, the Department of Defense, what we call decision point for committing to getting tankers on contract is one July. It's one July because uh, unfortunately, global tanker capacity is, uh, is not significant. And unfortunately, also the United States tanker capacity is very, very limited. So it requires 90 days uh, to get those tankers on contract. So that is why the requirements traceability assessment that led to the integrated production plan within the integrated master schedule to understand what is required and when and to sequence everything, and then to conduct what we call gate assessments, gate reviews to ensure that we're meeting all the requirements on time. Uh, and so far we are. So yes, the Department of Defense will have to make their decision on 1 July to get those uh, tankers on contract. Yeah, you know, thank you. You know, this is uh, reminds me of a very delicate dance that involves two parties, the Navy, the Department of Defense, and also the regulators. Because I also noticed on your schedule uh, that you also need the regulators to actually approve the defuel supplement to by around just before you put in that order for the tankers. And I, I've heard you need maybe 10 tankers to accomplish defueling the 104 million gallons out of there. So my question is actually for the regulators, are you on track to be able to approve their supplement to before the end of this month, which is only a few weeks away? Uh, for EPA, we are on track to, to, to meet those timelines. Uh, before these timelines were created, we did sit, sit down with uh, the Department of Health and the Joint Task Force uh, to ensure that um, we had adequate time to review uh, the documents. Uh, thank you. Or Joanna, do you want to speak for the DOH? Yes, the department is also on schedule, um, and we will be uh, providing information as, and comments as we need to. That's good to hear. And one, just one last comment uh, from experience. Uh, Erin Kawata and myself, we've been on this since 2014 and working with EPA and DOH, and also your consultant, PEMI. I specifically remember an assessment was done of the Red Hill facility uh, after the 2015 AOC was completed. And I think the assessment with the assistance of that particular consultant concluded that the Red Hill facility was a well-operated facility. So I just be a little careful and really pay attention to what they recommend. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, so if there are no further questions, we're just a little over time, which is fine, obviously, but um, we can move on to the next item on the agenda, which is the closure plan. So I'd like to turn it over to Admiral Barnett. Good afternoon. My name is Steve Barnett and I'm the commander of Navy Region Hawaii. Uh, next slide. Just wanted to talk with you uh, about a few things here. Closure plan, under the closure plan, the timeline and the status Red Hill tank closure, the phase of that, and then we're going to have Nakapuna talk a little bit about the um, a beneficial non-fuel reuse, and then, we'll, then I'll hand it over to Captain Gerthman to talk about remediation. While JTF has the defueling uh, portion, the Navy has responsible for the tank closure plan. The tank closure plan was initially released on 1 November of last year. This is an iterative plan, and can we go to the next slide, please? Thank you. Uh, this is an iterative plan and will be updated and modified through our conversation with the regulators, DOD leadership, and when more information needs to be provided. The tank closure plan has four options for closure. The first option is closure, close in place. The second option is close in pace, place for potential beneficial non-fuel reuse. This was requested that we look at this um, by uh, DOH during uh, 14 July of last year on a meeting that we had 
uh, with senior Navy leaders, also with DOH. The uh, third option is close and fill. And the fourth option is close and remove the still liner and fill. Uh, the Navy has formally requested DOH's approval on option one, which is to close in place. And executing this plan will take roughly three years. Why? Well, this is the most limited impact to the environment. It's the most limited impact to the surrounding community, the highest safety margin for completing the work. And fill option would be very difficult considering the immense size of the tanks and the amount of trucks that would be required. The closure plan has four phases and, is curr and currently we're executing phase one and two at this, at this time. And you'll see that on the next slide when we get there. But we're doing that in parallel with the JTF and the defueling plan. Phase one is the plan for cleaning and permanent tank closure, which includes the four surge tanks and all the associated piping. We're now in the process of updating our timeline to align with the defueling updated timeline from JTF and their supplement number two. Phase two is uh, the planning for the beneficial non-fuel reuse of the tanks. Like I mentioned, this was at the request of DOH to be included as a plan during our meet and confer on July the 14th of last year. Nakapuna opened its qualitative survey on 30 March to the public through the end of May, so it just completed. In addition, they've been conducting key stakeholder interviews during this time as well. They will present a final report in November of this year, categorizing all the input that was, that was received. This report will also be provided to regulators and posted to our public facing website. After this effort is completed, two other studies, and you can see them up there, uh, one is a UH alternative energy study, and the other is a legislative ad in the NDAA, in the 2023 NDAA, that was a legislative ad for a non-DOD fuel um, reuse option too. Upon receiving the feasibility analysis reports with the recommendations, and by the way, those three reports will go to, will be briefed to Congress um, in the February or March timeframe of next year. But uh, once we receive these reports, uh, they will all be reviewed by the DOD and by the state of Hawaii. Phase three and phase four of the tank closure plan are the preparation for the actual closure, which, which will start after the fuel. Supplement one was released to the regulators on February 28th, and that supported the tank closure plan's first major milestone, which is clean. And that includes the, mass, the management of all hazardous materials along with the spill plan. Uh, we've requested DOH's concurrence of this, and that's due uh, this month. So we're looking forward to getting that. Once we get that, we can start the actual uh, contracting for the cleaning process. Though there are 20 tanks, the scope will be to clean 14 tanks because four tanks recently completed the clean, inspect, and repair process. Two tanks have been out of service for over 15 years. But they will still be inspected to see if cleaning is required. Supplement two was released to the regulators uh, last week in efforts to provide amplifying information on closure in place, structural analysis, and responses to regulator comments on the analysis of alternatives that we received back uh, from supplement one. SGH was contracted to assess the long-term structural integrity of the Red Hill underground storage tanks in order to support closure in place as a permanent closure method for the Red Hill tanks. We have decided to remove and properly dispose of the three large fuel pipeline systems rather than clean them in place as previously described. With the pipelines removed, the tanks cannot be refilled. Pipeline removal is a clear and tangible demonstration of our commitment to the public and to the regulatory agencies and other stakeholders that we don't want this facility to be ever used for fuel or hazardous material again. Additionally, the benefits of pipeline removal include the following. It ensures the complete removal of any residual fuels that might be associated with the pipeline. It creates additional space within the tunnels, thereby providing the most flexibility for beneficial non-fuel reuse of the tanks and tunnels if so, de if so desired. And it eliminates the long-term maintenance of pipelines that no longer have an operational use. And finally, for the next steps, we continue to meet frequently with the regulators on our tank closure plan. In discussions with DOH, the tank closure team, my tank closure team will be releasing a supplemental line with each major milestone for the request so we can provide our regulators the most informed information. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now let's uh, go directly to uh, uh, Darlene Inge. Thank you. Um, I'm Darlene Egate. 
and I work for Nakapuna Consulting, and um, I'll be. Hi, I'm Darlene Ige. I work for Nakapuna Consulting, and I'll be talking about the out, outreach efforts for the um, closure plan. So just a little bit of background, and I think Admiral Barnett um, touched on this. In July of 2022, the Navy met with the Department of Health to discuss closure options. And during that meeting, the Department of Health requested that the Navy explore possible beneficial non-field uh, non uses for the Red Hill facility um, as part of the closure plan. So in January of this year, the Navy awarded a contract to Nakapuna Consulting to develop and execute a um, public outreach program to solicit information from the public on recommendations for the um, potential repurposing options for the uh, Red Hill facility. So the outreach program consists of three methods of collecting ideas from the public, and I'll be going through each of these. The first one is the uh, interview process that started April 3rd, and we completed it on um, 31 May. We conducted one-on-one -on -one interviews with 30 key stakeholders, which included Native Hawaiian organizations, environmental groups, neighborhood board uh, members, business um, people, and nonprofit sector, and also the local government, like elected, uh, elected officials. Some of the recurring themes we heard during the interviews were that uh, nearly half of the interviewees agreed with the overall idea of repurposing Red Hill facility um, with some caveats. Um, they wanted to ensure the protection and safety of the aquifer um, and that it, it can't impact the environment or pose a safety um, risk to anyone and it must benefit the island residents to the greatest extent possible. Um, many of the individuals interviewed expressed uncertainty of the repurposing. For example, um, you know, they don't know what the consequences of repurposing would be. Uh, they don't know the feasibility or the cost and uh, benefits of it, or they were unfamiliar with the uh, facility, so they didn't know the size of it or the existing condition, the terrain, and, you know, um, what the infrastructure was made of. Um, people also expressed during the interviews, um, there's deep distrust with the military at all levels. There's a desire for transparency and more opportunities for public dialogue. And there's a lack of trust was especially expressed with the native um, Hawaiian leaders. Uh, next slide. Yeah, so um, now I'm gonna be talking about the second method, which was um, the online survey. We conducted an online survey for two months from March 31st to May 31st. And this online survey was a qualitative survey and it wasn't intended to be representative of a specific population, but just to gain insight on what people on Oahu would like to use Red Hill for after defueling and closure. So we received 931 completed surveys and over 70% of the survey responders lived in Hawaii for over 20 years. And over half were not in favor of repurposing. So some of the suggestions they um, provided for repurposing was return the Red Hill facility to the state of Hawaii or native Hawaiians, use it for renewable energy resources, such as solar, battery storage, or hydroelectricity, uh, research and development, such as putting a UH lab there or some kind of technology development center, uh, putting a museum or historic attraction there, water storage or emergency, emergency shelter storage or agricultural use. The third data collection will be a quantitative survey. Um, we haven't started this um, process yet, but it'll include two data collections. One will be a mail out survey to the residents near the Red Hill area. And the second one would be an online survey to um, selected uh, residents on Oahu. And this will be a quantitative survey. So we will you know, try to get a representative um, sample size to represent the island of Oahu. Oahu. Um, the draft questions will on this survey will be available for review from 12 to 20 June, and then we plan to launch this survey at the end of June through September, early September. 
And the final report for all of this information will be available by the end of November of this year. Great, thank you very much. So um, let's turn over to, now to Department of Health and EPA for your uh, oversight of the uh, closure plan. Okay, so um, again, like defueling, uh, we're gonna give a joint presentation. Next slide. The Department of Health set out two priorities for the closure phase. Red Hill must be rendered permanently inoperable as a UST system and environmental monitoring must continue. The closure of the Red Hill facility is regulated by the department's statutes, rules, and emergency order. EPA's 2023 consent order with Navy DLA allows EPA to approve or disapprove the plan of closure for the tanks and associated infrastructure. EPA's regulatory authority extends to assistance and oversight of the department's UST and hazardous waste programs. Next slide, please. The department's emergency order requires a submittal of a phased plan for defueling and permanently closing the Red Hill UST facility. As you can see on this slide, the department review of sections of the closure phase of the closure plan are anticipated to occur in three stages and will be submitted by the Navy Region Hawaii. Again, reviewing in sections allows multiple tasks to occur concurrently expedites review and keeps the closure project on schedule. Next slide, please. Okay, so um, as Joanna had said, uh, EPA's authority to oversee the closure comes from our recent 2023 consent order. And uh, what has to be in the closure plan is um, up on the screen. Uh, these are the items that are, are required under the order. In addition to those, um, the closure plan must comply um, uh, with Hawaii underground storage tank regulations. Next slide. So EPA, Department of Health and Navy coordinate every day uh, to ensure preparation for closure. EPA and Department of Health meet every two weeks with the Navy to review the status of the closure plan uh, and we have topic specific meetings to reach resolution on specific issues similar to defueling. And uh, we also have senior leadership level discussions. The regular, regulatory agencies will have um, on site presence to ensure the work is performed according to the plans submitted by the Navy. Uh, periodic inspections will allow us to keep tabs on the status of closure as the timeline sh shifts to work that must occur after defueling. Next slide. Most recently, the department and EPA have commented on the closure plan and first supplement submitted by the Navy. Currently, DOH and EPA are reviewing supplement two of the closure plan, not to be confused with supplement two of the defueling plan. Supplement two of the closure plan was submitted last week the focus of this closure plan is how the Navy intends to clean the surge tanks, plans to remove the pipelines, and evaluated structural integrity of the tanks. This oversight by DOH and EPA ensures that closure occurs in an environmentally protective manner. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. Um, so let's open it up to some questions from the FTAC members. You can raise your hand if you have any. Okay, okay, so the Navy is in favor of closure in place, and the DOH seems to be favoring reusing the facility for non-fuel purposes, uh, and this is based on a conversation I had with a DOH representative at yesterday's open house, um, but, and I don't say this lightly, but I think I speak for a lot of people in my community when I say that we want the facility completely shut down. So there's absolutely no chance for reuse, no matter what that may entail, uh, because fresh water is priceless. And I, I am aware of the other options, what it basically entails, but I say again, you know, fresh water is priceless. So my question is, if you do follow through with the closure in place, um, and this question goes to 
all parties, but especially DOH and EPA. How can you prove to the public through your actions, not words, because words are cheap, that down the line, the facility won't be reused for fuel or a, a, another hazardous non-fuel material that will threaten our aquifer again? Thank you. Okay, um, I'll leave it to you. Who, who would like to respond to that first? Evan Barnett? Excuse me, I'll, I'll go ahead and go first. Um, as the Secretary of Defense had said, we are going to close Red Hill and the intent is not to use it for any type of fuel or hazardous material. So that is not our intent. Um, okay, any other uh, response to uh, that question before we go to the next one? Okay, so um, Dr. Lau. Um, thank you, Admiral Barnett, but I'm afraid that the Secretary of Defense will change in 2024. And so whatever he says now may not hold them. So you cannot be that reassuring to me that his word will continue. Um, the second point I had is for Nakukuna. The, I looked at the survey online, there's nine questions. And to me, the deck was stacked. There was never a question of, would you like to have this closed? It was more, what should we do as alternatives? So you already stacked the deck with the question. And being in medicine, I know that that is a good way to spew the data, but I just want to make that comment. Um, yeah. The other comment I have is for EPA and Department of Health. You say you're having every two week meetings with the Navy. Could you please post somewhere the minutes of these meetings, the agenda, at least about what you talked about and what the resolution was? And are we still kicking the can down the road every two weeks? Are we getting further in our uh, solutions? Um, and I forgot one more thing for Nakupuna. You said you had a meeting with 10 stakeholders. And they were in the um, community. Could you actually name those people on your website? You said there were Native Hawaiian groups and legislators, and that would be kind of useful for everybody to know. Thank you. Okay, so um, we had four questions. I kind of counted up. Okay, so uh, I'm forgetting actually which one came first, to be quite honest. But uh, if any of the um, panelists over here have a response to any of the four, uh, please let me know. Ma'am, I understand your, your concern, um, but we're going with what the Secretary of Defense said. My intention is to set the standards so it cannot be reused for fuel. But I understand your concern, ma'am. Okay. Um, and if, if I, I could just, just ask the audience if we could just kind of withhold um, the dialogue for now, because it actually kind of distracts some of the people sometimes who are watching on TV or trying to hear the question or the response. I would really appreciate that. Thank you very much. Um, Melanie, was there one of those questions that you still uh, are looking for a response? Because if you could also just ask one at a time, it's easier to keep track. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. I like, no, no, to do no. That. So for the Nakapuna person, would you please name the people that you um, had the focus group with? Number two is, um, I think the deck was stacked. And that's just a comment on that side. Thank you for about the Secretary of Defense. But there is a... I don't know what it's called, like a little provision in the NDAA that says the Secretary of Defense still gets to sort of decide if there's an emergency and therefore everything we discussed today is off the table. So that is what I'm concerned about is that he actually just signed the order and says this place is closed and it's going to be removed or whatever. I mean, that is the option a lot of you said the number was 50% wanted to reuse it. Well, I'm looking at your graph and 52% actually wanted it removed. So I'm not sure we're looking at the data the same way, Nakapuna person. Um, sorry, I forgot my other question was, oh yeah, can the, we, minutes, the minutes. Can we pause um, and let her answer that? Go ahead. Okay. Uh, Darlene Ige, any response? Just to repeat the question, was it, you wanted to, uh, the list of the people we interviewed? Is that, was that one of the questions? I think you said you had like a focus group of legislators and uh, Native Hawaiian people. Yeah, we well, we interviewed 30 
30. Oh, 30. Okay. Do you have a list of those people? I do. Okay, I'm good. Would you, you don't want me to. No, no, no. I don't read it off now. now, but I'm, I, you know, you have a website. So could you put it up there? Uh, okay. That would be well, useful. To the Navy, but we can if, you know, with our approval. Oh, wait. Oh, you're a subcontractor. Is that why? No, no. We're, uh, we're contracted by the Navy. Right. So you don't have your own website. It has to be Navy website. Well, we have a separate website that we made for this project. But we do work with the Navy to get approval to do these things. Where would you be posting it then so I know where to look? Um, I would think it would be that www.redhillrepurposing.com. That that's the website we've been using. Okay. 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 So we will post it. Okay. Um, do any other FTAC members have any other questions uh, before we move on to the next agenda item? Attorney Lau. I'll keep this really brief, but uh, uh, Admiral Barnett, uh, thank you for being willing to remove the three large pipelines. I think it's a positive step. You know, this is each pipeline is over, a little over three miles, connects the Pearl Harbor to the tanks. Uh, so that's a total of nine miles of pipes that have to get removed. I think it's a positive. Uh, just ask you to consider going a step further. Uh, Disable the pump house, remove the infrastructure there that's not necessary to support joint base Pearl Harbor Hickam, but no longer needed to pump 200 plus million gallons of fuel three miles inland. So that's unnecessary infrastructure. So remove that part of the pump house. The other thing to consider, again, I, and we've talked before, uh, strip off the liner, the quarter inch steel uh, tank liner in all of the tanks, at least the bottom half of that, and, and uh, remediate any track fuel behind the line uh, and try to fill it with some kind of material, inert material. Then I would say, I think I can rest a little easier that this won't be easily repurposed or brought back into fuel storage in the future. And I would maybe ask consideration by the EPA and Department of Health in the approved tank closure plans to actually specify these requirements clearly so that you can, Amy, and I believe that you're going to do a good job trying to enforce this, that you can enforce this against the DOD forever. Okay. Thank you. So uh, several so, suggestions from Ernie Lau. So, uh, Emil Burnett, would you like to respond, please? Gary, uh, I acknowledge those, and I will look into those options, okay? So, yeah, as you know, this is an iterative process, so we're going to be looking at all things, sir. So. Okay, um, so we are kind of a little late, but not bad. Um, but I appreciate uh, all the brevity. That's always good if we can try to get through all of this and then we can uh, open it up for the public uh, comments and questions. Let's move straight now into the remediation update. And um, I believe uh, Captain Gersma, are you leading that off? Thank you. You could just do a, a quick self introduction and then launch into your slides. Yeah, aloha. Good afternoon. And thank you for the opportunity to be here today. I'm Captain Cameron Gertzma, Commanding Officer for NAFAC Hawaii, uh, and also the Regional Engineer uh, to the Commander Navy Region Hawaii. Um, the DoD JTF Department of Navy are, as we previously stated, committed to facilitating the removal of all fuel from the facility and the exploration of non fuel use, reuse alternatives, as well as some of the other options we've discussed today, iterative process. Um, the adherence to all the laws, regulations, and policies, and we'll continue to be as transparent and openly possible with sharing information with interested parties, which we've done through those websites and, and trying to continue to do through numerous meetings that we have uh, during the week or the month and different engagements at state and local um, outreach events, or, or just we call them briefings as well. We talk about the Red Hill Subcommittee as well for the state. I'd like, like to begin, begin by updating the committee on our drinking and, and, and water uh, long-term monitoring efforts and then transition into progress made regarding our remediation actions. Since December 2021, the Red Hill shaft has been disconnected from the Navy drinking water system. The Wyava shaft has been the sole source of water, all Navy drinking water um, since December 2021. In March of 2022, following DOH's event, amending of the health advisory declaring water safe to drink, the Navy began a two-year program of long-term monitoring. And you can see up here, this is exactly what we've completed to date, five periods. We have two more periods remaining, 
And of such, we've taken over 5,300 samples. We just completed period five uh, of the long-term monitoring and we're finalizing the end of the period and summary reports that will be submitting to DOH for review and approval before posting to the website, but we will be doing that and you'll be able to see those results. As just stated, we have 5,300 samples, upwards of 6,100 to date, and all the results are available through our Safe Waters website. The interactive map tool allows users to easily search the results by address and specific location, such as your child's school or your house and show those results. The map also includes an instructional video to help explain how to find your results and understand what they mean. And this was as a result of people's uh, ideas and, and coming, providing us valuable feedback to make it uh, more interactive. And at the same time, trying to do our best to be very transparent with what we're finding. Since we started long-term monitoring, we have a total of 19 exceedances that have been linked to what we would call fixtures, faucets, sinks, and the like. And each of those have been closed out after flushing or the replacement of the fixture. Uh, and then before resampling uh, to confirm that the exceedance was corrected. In most of these cases of the 19, they've been lead exceedances, uh, very minor above the 15 parts per billion, just a touch above, but we'll flush, replace the fixture. And we've since been able to demonstrate that there was no uh, uh, health concern. And we've not had a detection of JP5 or jet fuel in the drinking water system since the long-term monitoring program has begun. If a resident does have concern uh, with their drinking water, as you can see up here at the bottom, uh, we welcome them calling the emergency operations center at that number, and we'll have teams avail available to immediately come out and test the water. For residents on the distribution system that haven't been tested in the long-term monitoring program and would like to be, they're also able to call that number and get their resident on, on the list. If they've looked at that website and they can you know, determine that they've either been tested or they haven't. To date, when we're done, I think we're upwards right now of about 80% of the residents and schools, uh, health clinics and, um, and the like have been uh, sampled to date. We're committed to ensuring every household, school and facility is safe uh, for drinking water. Next slide, please. There's a lot going on here. This is a really good slide. We post this one also on the Safe Waters website as well. So it's available for uh, review, understanding some of the, the remediation recovery efforts we're doing today and we still have in the future. Since the previous FTAC meeting, the Navy has continued to make additional steps in the characterization of the subsurface conditions and recovery actions to protect the aquifer. In previous committee updates, the Navy has utilized many slides to discuss our various efforts. This slide shows all those efforts uh, to raise awareness of where we have been, where we are now, and where we need to go in the future. At the top of the slide, I want to bring attention to the fact that the Navy continues to perform groundwater sampling uh, for water quality and potential plume migration, and also performing vapor monitoring at various points within the tank structure area, around the tanks area, down the, down the tunnels and the attics, uh, to make sure that we're appropriately uh, protecting and monitoring any potential release detection. The Navy remains committed to performing sampling at appropriate frequencies and analytical methods to inform and assess the subsurface conditions around the Red Hill facility. To this end, the Navy has continued its efforts to expand the ground monitoring, monitoring well network around Red Hill and the subsequent outlying areas, which essentially has doubled our locations and our well networks. I'll discuss this important effort in a few minutes on my next slide. The next section highlights many of the characterization efforts that will occur in the vicinity of Added 3, which was where the November 2021 spill took place, or the release of the fuel. As many are aware, the tunnel system provides many challenges, physical constraints that we must overcome. This has required the Navy to utilize a multitude of characterization efforts to understand the subsurface conditions to get after the fuel that was released unaccounted for and we're, we've not stopped in those efforts. These efforts have led to remediation efforts that have been completed already, like the leach field excavation, which I reported on during the last update, but there's still other characterization efforts and uh, deep soil borings, as well as monitoring uh, cutouts to get after those areas where once we identify that there might be fuel uh, underneath the concrete in those areas, 
that we have, we make every effort to remove those. The Navy currently has a few work plans shown by the three stars and characterization efforts section in the middle that have been discussed with both EPA and DOH. Uh, these plans supporting, these plans that we've discussed with them will support those ongoing remediation efforts. Some of these efforts, um, as I said, have been briefed before, but what I wanna talk about also is that we've had skimmers in the water, we have absorbent pads, we collect as, many, as much of any film that remains, uh, which has been significantly reduced, if not to the point where we don't see uh, anything within the Red Hill shaft, um, and also the GAC system that we have right out front to make sure that we're continuing to monitor the quality of the water where we do test for TPH, before we do release it into the Halaba stream, as well as perform other analyte tests, uh, water tests associated with groundwater to make certain that we're not missing something uh, overall. The Navy's heard you loud and clear in the community's feedback regarding the amount of water uh, and the GAX discharge. We talked about this at several different meetings. Uh, DLNR, Red uh, the Red Hill Subcommittee, Seaworm, even here at the FTAC. Uh, the committee's feedback regarding the amount of water uh, is important and the understanding of potentially that waste. In response to this feedback in coordination with the EPA and the DOH, the Navy is in the progress of a flow optimization study to determine if the system could be pumped at a reduced usage while meeting the capture zone requirements by the state of Hawaii's emergency order. The Navy has been pumping at various cycles over the past several months and monitoring the impacts of those various cycles. Since April, we continue um, we've continued and will continue over the next couple of weeks to look at reducing that water that we're pumping right now from where we were at about 4.5 to down to 1.8. Once we're done and we're looking at what the drawdown and just the impact is to the aquifer relative to various elevations across that aquifer, uh, as well as continuing to sample um, from a groundwater safety perspective, then we're going to share that with EPA and DOH and make a determination. Are we safe enough? Do we see any impacts? Do we have enough data on that? And I, and I welcome, obviously, there's other opportunities for other leadership out there that is very informed uh, from a scientific perspective, understanding that, and we value the opinion as well. You will note also on the slide our uh, efforts to remediate any PFAS contaminated at Red Hill following the tw November 2022 uh, AFFF mishap outside at six. Following that event, the Navy immediate, uh, immediately evacuated the impacted soil from the site, verifying through soil samples that gross contamination had been successfully removed. And we began collecting uh, weekly groundwater samples to test for PFAS at the nine proper wells and the, and the wells located around Red Hill, as well as the Red Hill shaft. Uh, this sampling is ongoing and it's done weekly. We'll continue to, uh, as part of the groundwater sampling plan and the overall sampling plan. And the results from these samples have all been uh, below environmental action levels uh, and indicate that the AFFF released during the November 2022, 2022 uh, did not reach the groundwater. In addition to the groundwater sampling in April, uh, we've also completed drinking water sampling for PFAS in accordance with EPA's requirements. And those results have shown at the Wyava shaft, our only source of drinking water in the Navy's distribution system is we have a non-detector PFAS at this point in time. Ultimately, a majority of the information collected from the groundwater sampling and remediation activities will inform or be considered when developing the groundwater flow. The contaminant fate and transport models are important and understanding that as we move through that scientifically uh, will make a difference in our ability to assess and move forward for longer term remediation. The Navy remains committed to continue subject matter expert discussions and updates to the regulatory agencies in order to reach a model that will pro provide the most likely flow scenario. We're looking right now uh, to have something uh, to DOH by June, uh, excuse me, July that has a model for discussion, and then we'll continue to evolve that in those conversations with uh, the informed parties and interested parties that will end up trying to get something completed. Uh, the goal is by September. So we are looking to accelerate this. In parallel to the Navy, and this is, forgive me, this is September 2024, 
but I want to make certain that we're going to have a model, at least for conversation to move through. This is a challenging conversation based on uh, expertise and opinions, um, based on experience and subject matter expertise where it resides. In parallel to the Navy's ongoing modeling network, our Office of Naval Research awarded a grant to the University of Hawaii. So it's not just the Navy that's working on a model locally and receiving feedback from DOH or the EPA or USGS. Uh, we've also given a grant uh, to University of Hawaii, which gives them flexibility and autonomy to develop a model that they see fit. And so then that's the issue where we'll start to pull that information together and try to reconcile what we think is the most accurate or most best represented of what we're seeing in the aquifer. And we're excited for this, for the University of Hawaii to get this underway. Dr. Uh, Thomas uh, should be doing that this summer. And finally, the Navy understands the importance of the Joint Task Force defueling effort. The Navy plays a piece uh, in this, ensuring various protection plans and procedures are in place prior to defueling, as Vice Admiral Wade's already said. Next slide, please. Uh, uh, if I could just interrupt for a moment, we're getting a little long on time, so if I could encourage you to kind of move through the Do high 30 points. seconds. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, so what I wanted to highlight here was that we've had over the course, we initially had nine proper wells for Red Hill that were specifically groundwater monitoring over, and then we expanded that over the course of probably 24 to 2015 based on the AOC. And we had about 21 wells. To date, we're looking to add another 22 wells. Um, we have, uh, I think it's nine already in place. Um, or, and then we're looking for another 13, uh, four currently underway. That'll go, you know, 17, and then we'll continue to add more. We are trying to work with and partner closely with DOH on this, as well as BWS to find the right locations that make the most sense to protect the environment and the people. And I know Mr. Lau has been working uh, with the Navy uh, to look at how do we do a sample, where should be the wells, and how we can actually move forward to make sure we're protecting all uh, citizens on the state of Hawaii. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you very much. So let's move straight into uh, both the uh, Department of Health EPA oversight for this and then uh, to the plume analysis. Thank you. Allison and I will be presenting on this subject. Next slide, please. As the party responsible for the contamination of our aquifer, the Navy is responsible for mediation efforts. Under close watch of the DOH and EPA who continue to work together to oversee the work the Navy is doing as required by the 2015 Administrative Order on Consent and the DOH's emergency order. Oversight has been ongoing and will continue during and after defueling and closure. State, federal, and city leaders pledged to work together to create a proactive approach to aquifer remediation. Next slide. So we would like to highlight several actions that the regulatory agencies have taken since the last FTAC. In February, we issued a letter to bring the 2015 AOC up to speed with current events. We clarified that the 2015 AOC still requires investigation and remediation of all past and future releases and identified the completed and ongoing environmental response as well as assessment to address the recent releases that have occurred. This letter also clarified that the work no longer required um, due to the decision to close the facility, such as the previous work um, related to upgrading of tanks. As part of this letter, we also required a consolidated schedule for all of the environmental investigation and remediation work underway with targeted submission dates as well as decision dates and that this schedule be updated quarterly. You saw that schedule uh, I think presented by Captain Gertzma earlier, and the schedule is made available to the public um, on the Red Hill environmental section of Navy's uh, Safe Waters website. Additionally, EPA and DOH continue to convene the Red Hill Remediation Roundtable, which we started last year. In 2023, we are meeting every other month with senior leaders from Board of Water Supply, Commission on Water Resources Management, and USGS, as well as the Navy, to discuss the active and planned work to investigate and remediate the contamination caused by the Red Hill facility. In addition to these bi-monthly meetings, we have quarterly roundtable subject matter expert workshops to bring all of our subject matter experts together to get further technical input to support EPA and DOH in our decision-making. 
We also have been working to make Red Hill data and findings more accessible to the public. EPA and DOH have been hosting a webinar series called Red Hill In Focus to share information with the public on what the agencies are doing to address impacts to human health and the environment from Red Hill facility releases. The first two webinars were held in January and April of this year, and the next webinar is actually going to be next week on Tuesday, June 13th, to discuss the 2023 consent order and the revisions that were made in response to public input. These webinars are recorded and are posted on EPA's website. Um, we also have heard input from Board of Water Supply as well as what we've heard from previous uh, public meetings. And in response to that, we just launched an online interactive application on our website that displays the Red Hill groundwater monitoring data in maps, graphs, and tables to make it easier to understand. This application will be regularly updated with the data as it is available from the Navy. Next slide. We continue to work with the Navy to expand the groundwater network and collect groundwater samples in locations that will help the Navy to evaluate groundwater conditions, understand groundwater flow near Red Hill, and monitor outlying areas to confirm and understand, sorry, to confirm that Red Hill contamination hasn't traveled long distances from the facility towards off-site drinking water wells. We also are collecting soil vapor samples to monitor contamination from 2021 and earlier releases, as well as to provide early detection of any possible new releases. We review and comment on the Navy's groundwater flow model to help the Navy revise the models to reflect Red Hill specific hydrogeology and encourage beneficial use of water discharge to Halava Stream and safely decrease the volume of water wasted each day. We also continue to evaluate data related to the 2021 added three releases of fuel and the 2022 added six release of aqueous film forming foam. Next slide, please. We also wanted to highlight some items that are priorities, um, especially in light of defueling, that will help us gain knowledge so we can understand the risks and ensure that Navy is prepared to respond quickly and effectively to any releases and understand where contamination might go um, as it moves through the environment. First of those is collection of fuel samples. Uh, Navy did collect fuel samples from the tanks um, in April of 2023, and EPA and DOH are still awaiting uh, the analysis and results. Uh, additionally, collection of additional field data as well, um, including uh, testing of open boreholes, data logging of water quality parameters, and in well tracer uh, studies. Uh, this will help us better understand how uh, the contamination might move within the environment. More frequent soil and soil vapor samples and prompt reporting of these results. This is really key to being able to detect any releases that might occur in the environment early. And then lastly, a groundwater protection plan update, um, revised with site-specific knowledge that was gained from the 2021 and 2022 releases. Uh, you know, the current risk-based screening levels of the Department of Health uh, and triggers for identifying and tracking any new releases, if any may occur early and protocols for protecting nearby drinking water wells. Next slide. All right, so this next presentation, we wanted to cover a couple methods that the regulators are using to look at the groundwater data to better understand what is happening in the aquifer. So today we're gonna to go over two methods that were used um, to show the plumes that are depicted in this presentation. First, looking at the maximum concentrations of certain chemicals, and the second method, looking at the number of exceedances of risk-based screening levels. Um, these maps of certain time periods can be viewed side by side, to understand the changes in the groundwater contamination over time. Okay. Next Let me just interrupt. Is it a, a point about visibility or, because uh, we'll take questions in just a minute when they're done. Before we get too far ahead, I just wanted to see if we could ask questions because there's a lot of information. I realize that. This is yeah, kind of a pack item. You're right. going to be getting a whole lot of questions I as we go through all this material. But. Right, right. No, I, I thought you were bringing the point is whether or not the slide is visible. But if she can just uh, continue on, then we'll take all the questions after that. Thank you very much. Yeah, next slide.
Next slide, please. Yes, thank you. So this slide shows a set of maximum contamination, maximum concentration maps for middle range of petroleum, also known as the total petroleum hydrocarbon diesel range or TPHD. Warm colors like red and orange show higher concentrations of TPHD in the centers of the maps. The colors become bluer at the outer edges of the plumes where their concentrations are lower. The before 2021 releases map shows maximum concentrations and cumulative data collected from May 2020 to May 21st, 2021. Plumes are depicted directly under and to the northwest of the tanks and west of the Red Hill uh, shaft. While it shows the plumes are disconnected, we also have a question mark shown in between because we are not certain of where the, what is there. Uh, the late 2021 map shows maximum concentrations of TPHD right after the May and 20, November 2021 releases. The TPHD plumes expanded. The red and orange areas of higher TPHD concentrations also expanded under the tank farm and directly over Red Hill Shaft. In the April 2022 map, the plume still appears larger than the first pre-2021 release figure, but the red and orange areas of highest concentration are getting smaller. The plume boundaries are also slightly smaller. The most recent plume map for early 2023 continues to show lower TPHD concentrations and smaller plume boundaries. The pattern of expanding, shrinking, boundaries and increased decrease in concentration are typical patterns for petroleum releases. Next slide, please. This slide shows maximum concentration maps for changes over time in the heavy range fuel, also known as total petroleum hydrocarbons oil range or TPHO. The figures show similar patterns of increasing concentrations and plume boundaries after the 2021 releases that we saw in the TPHD maps. The 2023 results show smaller boundaries and decreases in the maximum concentrations of TPHO in groundwater samples. Next slide, please. So this next slide shows the different method of looking at the groundwater data um, by looking at frequencies of exceedances of the environmental action levels or EALs. Um, and this shows a similar pattern what we saw with the first method, a similar increase of the footprint of sample results that did exceed EALs um, and in the months that followed the 2021 releases. And over time, the footprint and number of exceedances have decreased. Next slide. This table, sorry, it's very difficult to read, represents maximum results of PFAS that have been detected in groundwater samples from Red Hill and have an established or proposed risk-based screening level. Only one result is highlighted, which is PFAS in the Red Hill shaft. The result is highlighted because it exceeds pending drinking water maximum contaminant levels, MCLs. No results in the table exceed current department environmental action levels or the EPA regional screening levels. Next slide, please. So lastly, we just wanted to post here a link to the uh, EPA's Red Hill Groundwater Results application, as well as links to where you can find the data on DOH's as well as Navy's website. Okay, thank you very much. And before we get to the questions, um, I believe all of that information is online, is that correct? So we realized that was a lot of uh, data, a lot of maps, but if you go actually to this uh, meeting's uh, website, you can pull all of that and look at it uh, more closely. Um, so let's take some questions from the FTAC uh, members. Okay, uh, Ashley Nishihara, you're first. Sorry, Ernie, you gotta get your hand up faster. Okay, well, first something positive. Um, I noticed at the, uh, I was pleased to see at the open house yesterday that, well, you know, if you had just told me that, oh, we're installing new monitoring wells, I'd be like, so what, you know, but I saw there were two websites that are being created that monitor not only the, um, that the public can access, that no, not only monitor the groundwater around the facility, but also the water, the drinking water, uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, of um, some houses. I don't know what, what that extends to, but I was pleased to see that. So um, 
the engineers who explained that seemed to be really with it and you know spot on so props to them um but one one concern that I had was the impression that I got uh, from the Navy seemed they seemed to think that um the microbes in the soil that naturally occur in the soil will just mostly take care of the fuel by itself. And there were mention of other methods such as soil vapor extractions and air splurging, but other than that, it doesn't really seem like any further effort will be made in terms of active remediation of the soil. So will there be further proactive exploration into other natural methods that can be safely implemented in order to speed up the process of remediation, such as like, for, in for instance, introducing more microbes into the soil, you know, et cetera? Thank you. Okay, um, Captain Gershman, would you like to field that? Yeah, I would say this is that um, you're absolutely correct. Th that when we talk about natural attenuation, it, it's part of just, it's gonna be a part of the plan, but it's not the sole plan. And so we're looking at those technologies. And I think we can look at, uh, as we partner with industry to find out what are the best technologies, because there's, uh, there's good ideas out there that aren't necessarily tested. Um, but we can actually post those and maybe put some of that stuff online and, and maybe look for those, the comments and the feedback as well on something we may be missing, but at least communicating appropriately. Okay, thank okay. you. Okay, and uh, before moving on to the next question, does EPA or DOH have any additional comment before we move on to the next question? Yeah, I, I would say that, you know, it's, it's a requirement under the 2015 AOC for them to do a complete comprehensive investigation and remediation of, like I said previously, the past and any potential future releases. So we've emphasized with our February letter, the, the clarification of 2015 AOC, um, that it is important for there to be a com comprehensive approach um, and, you know, considering the, the recent releases that have occurred as well to make sure that there is a plan that is submitted um, and, and that plan be complete. Okay, thank you. Ernie Lau? Uh, somebody else can go first if they would you'd like to have somebody else go first. Oh, uh, Claire Trumbler, did you want to add on to that? I know you're with the EPA, of course. I have a question. As an oh, if we could, uh, um, I think Ernie Lau had his hand up first. And then Certainly. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, lots of information in a relative short period of time. So I think um, part of our challenge is how does this information get communicated in a way that the community can understand? Uh, because it just probably just confuses people. But uh, thank you. Can we go back to the slide uh, with the uh, PFAS results at a different monitoring well locations? Okay, it's a little tiny, but uh, wherever you see a number, that's actually a detection. And um, again, I go back to the issue. Uh, normally in the environment, you wouldn't have PFAS chemicals uh, like this. And these are 10 locations. I, and I advocate from the from November of 2022, actually it's probably December, my request of the Navy was to test all monitor well locations uh, that exist and future monitor well locations to test immediately for PFAS also at those locations. And I, I just reiterate that request of both the Navy and the regulators. I do want to acknowledge that uh, for the first time, there seems to be progress in being able to access the Navy's drinking water source, Red Hill Shaft, and some other monitor wells for board of water supply to draw samples and to be able to get results that we develop ourselves. So I just a mahalo. Uh, continue to look forward to working with you on that. Uh, yeah, no, that's uh, that was that was really awesome. I appreciate that. Uh, but look at these PFAS numbers. Um, they're all over the place. They're not at one location and they're multiple PFAS chemicals. The thing I've been asking is what has been used at the Red Hill facility that could be adding to this load of PFAS in the environment okay. that's being found in the groundwater. So the question I have is uh, how, and this is for the Navy and also for the EPA and the DOH, because if you look at the PFOS, that's a eight carbon PFAS chemical that's been proposed to be by the EPA to have a drinking water regulation, maybe in about a year, four parts per trillion. And the number there, and this is in Red Hill shaft, 
seven three parts per trillion. Where did it come from? Because the chemicals that were spilled in November of 2022, the PFAS chemicals in the AFFF was the newer versions of the PFAS chemicals and didn't supposedly contain the eight carbon or PFOS or PFOA PFAS chemicals. So where, where is this coming from? Uh, folks in the Navy, uh, if you know the answer, and also the EPA and Department of Health. Okay, okay thank, thank you. you. So let's uh, take a response to that question, please. Um, anybody from the Navy in particular? Sarah, can you answer that? Yes, sir. Uh, I'm Sarah Moody. I am the deputy for the Red Hill Environmental Team under NAFAC Hawaii. Uh, so Ernie, this specific result was collected in December of 2021, immediately following the events that infiltrated fuel into the Red Hill shaft. And right before this result was collected, we had divers in the well with their hazmat suits, with protective gear, with their materials and equipment. Since that specific result, all of the other results from the Red Hill shaft have been consistent with the 1.08, um, consistent with the other results in the groundwater. So we continue to look at these results and pursue any understanding of where they may be coming from but we understand that they're of a concern and we take them very seriously. Okay. Um, does uh, EPA or DOH have any other additional information you wanna, or response? Okay. Um, Ernie, if, if it's a follow up on the same question, great. Otherwise, if we could go to Claire and then come back to you. Uh, I'm sorry, you want-, you want If this is a follow up to that, please ask it. Otherwise, if we could go to Claire, if you still have a question. Go ahead, Claire. Okay, thank you. Claire Chandler, EPA. Yes, thank you. My question is for Captain um, Gertzma. Um, I think you said there are 13 additional wells that shall be installed. When Can you clarify if that is the number and when they will be installed, when they will all be in place? Thank you. Um, so I'm clear is that there, there were 22 that new ones that we wanted to install. Um, there's nine already installed. There's 13 more to go. Uh, so I might have said those numbers too fast. So of the 13 that remain for those 22 that we're going to add, uh, four are under construction right now, and we have nine uh, more to follow after that. The, care, the, the issue with the nine to follow is that we have tentative locations where we're working uh, with landowners, private entities off federal property uh, to actually expand the well uh, team, if you will. And that goes from wells at Red Hill proper. Then it goes to plume delineation wells that allow us to work with EPA, DOH, and, and UWS well to understand it, is it propagating? And then its next one is sentinel wells, the furthest out that will continue to protect. And that's what we're working on right now. And do you have a projected date when they will all be in? Yeah, I, I would say we have a projected. Yeah, so February of, of uh, 2024, ideally. But again, it also comes down to real estate agreements and some of the things that we might need to you know, work with uh, the state because it's all uh, federal land. But that's our goal right now by February of 2024. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Um, Ernie Lau. Uh, thank you. I, I have this burning question uh, for the Department of Health. Uh, when the Department of Health, and thank you, Joanna and Kathy also, and, and other members of your staff appeared before the Water Board back in December of last year in January, I think it went on for like five hours, that part of the agenda, but uh, it, we were informed that DOH was doing a study of additives uh, in the fuel that could have gotten into the fuel into the water system at Joint Base Pearl Harbor Hickam back in 2021. So I just want, wanted to know what is the status of those additives, you know, including like antifreeze or other things that might be uh, added to the fuel in addition to the petroleum products, the total TPH. So where where is that at and when can the results be made public? The study for the additives is currently in progress. 
and we are waiting for the results to come back to continue our review and evaluation of the um, of the new limit. So uh, we are we are working on it. Yeah, I appreciate that. And as soon as you get the results, if you could share with the Board of Water Supply or, and with the community, because I still feel the pain that the people that drank the water back in 2021 went through. And understanding what could have been in their water, I think, might help explain some of the symptoms. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, Dr. Dr. Lau. I wanted to give Ernie as much time as you needed, but can we have the um, heat maps back up? Um, yeah, oh, uh, go back to the other one. That's good. So you're trying to show me that the air, the um, area that you're finding fuel is changing and contracting over time. Is that what you're trying to show me? And are the data points that you gathered always the same data points or did they install new monitoring well so there's more data points or different ones? So the data points will be uh, included as they're brought up, brought online. So this does reflect additional data points. Okay. Um, I guess I'm supposed to feel uh, reassured that it's contracting, but I did want to point out something is that it's always red under tank five. And as you recall, that's what started all of this. So I'm concerned that it's been there ever since 2014. And how are you going to remediate that? And are we really going to investigate it if we decide to fill in the tanks and closure in place? You're going to not be able to figure that out. The evaluation of the area under tank five will be part of the closure process. So yes, it will be addressed. I'm sorry, use the microphone if you're. Is it going to require extra? What did you say under tank five? Um, if if it's needed, then we will have to evaluate that and uh, require additional work as needed. So if they decide to fill in the tanks, how are you going to? look at that how are you going to monitor that that will be something that the navy will have to propose to the to the regulatory agencies and we will look at that proposal of how they would like to address it so to be determined yes okay um i don't want to close this off prematurely we are running a little late and we're um we have one more agenda item to go through uh but any last question on this? I know remediation is long and ongoing and will probably be repeated in information at several different events. Uh, Ashley Nishihara. Okay, so I just wanted to echo uh, Melanie's earlier question and um, and something that the EPA and, and DOH said that, you know, they will be holding the Navy accountable for the whole process, you know, so from the fueling throughout the entire process of remediation, correct? Right. So what are the consequences if the Navy doesn't follow through for whatever reason? I just wanted to know. We'll be utilizing the 2015 AOC and the, the department's emergency order as well as the 2023 consent order to do this. Um, to hold them accountable. Okay, but what are the actual like consequences? Like if, you know, they, you know, like a fine, a slap on the wrist, or you, you know what I mean? So there, there will be fines that we are looking at um, imposing depending on the, um, the results of what um, are causing the delay or the, or the uh, problems. So it is re relative to what we are finding at the at the situation, what the situation is. Okay, um, so I think we're ready to go into the last agenda item before we take a break and go to public comment and question. Um, so I'd like to turn it over to, I guess, Admiral Wade again um, to update on the uh, AFFF release response 
and uh, then um, we'll proceed from there. Test. Okay, thank you, sir. So uh, let me just uh, quickly summarize because I know we're uh, a little bit behind here. But uh, the 29 November uh, AFFF mishap that occurred at Red Hill uh, occurred while facility maintenance was being conducted by contractors hired by the United States Navy. Um, although Joint Task Force uh, was not involved with this maintenance, given the gravity of the situation and understanding the context of what happened in 2021, within two hours of the incident, I was on the phone with the Secretary of Defense and with Admiral Aquilino, and I took ownership of the situation. My boss and I believed that it was what the community expected, what our elected officials expected, and quite honestly, the right thing to do. I immediately ordered an investigation. It was important to have someone off island, uh, experts that had no, uh, exp not experience, but uh, any type of involvement in anything with Red Hill to get an objective assessment. That assessment uh, was completed and there was a determination of two causal factors for the mishap. The first was that a contractor hired by, hired by the Navy installed a valve improperly in April of 2022 when there was a temporary modification to the AFFF system. And then on 29 November, that same contractor company failed to disable or what we call lock out or disconnect the AFFF pumps while the contractor was conducting maintenance and because of those two causal factors, that led to approximately 1,300 gallons of AFFF concentrate spilling. Those causal factors are based on engineering and technical facts. I reviewed in detail the investigation, and it is my opinion also that the Navy should have had greater oversight of the contractor during the install and also during the maintenance, given the context of the 21 spills and the fact that AFFF is a hazardous, hazardous material that contains uh, PFAS and it sits above the aquifer. So the bottom line is it, it was human error and also this mishap was preventable. About a week after the incident, Admiral Aquilino, my boss, expanded the Joint Task Force's mission and responsibilities in that prior to December 6th, I, the JTF, was responsible for all activities leading up to and then the execution of defueling. But all other maintenance, whether preventative or corrective maintenance and, and environmental remediation, those were being conducted by other Navy commands. On December 6th, he directed me to take centralized control and apply risk measures to avoid or reduce the risk of a mishap from happening again. My team and I took that added responsibilities very, very seriously. We did an immediate mission analysis. I realized that I needed more people. When we did the assessment, we determined that we needed over 100 personnel. And within 30 days, those personnel arrived. We've in implemented a number of uh, risk measures to include physical control of the facility, uh, soldiers and airmen at the entry control points, uh, military escorts with every contractor, and I can go on and I can answer questions. The bottom line is, again, we are doing this to reduce risk. I provided three recommendations in this investigation. The first was that because it's a Navy facility and I don't have contracting authority, I recommended that the Department of Navy do an assessment on their oversight and their quality assurance program to prevent something like this from happening again. The Department of Navy has agreed with that and they're conducting that assessment. Second. 
because the military deals with hazardous materials in our training, in our maintenance, not only here in Hawaii, but across the Pacific, and the larger Department of Defense uses it globally, I recommended that the investigation be forwarded to the Secretary of Defense to be distributed to all commands in the hopes that we can learn from this lesson and reduce the risk of having another hazardous material uh, incident like this. And that was accepted and then the Secretary of Defense has distributed it globally to all subordinate commands. And then lastly, uh, because again, I don't own the facility, I don't own the contracts, I cannot make a determination on liability or accountability, but I believe that that is something that is important and that the community expects. And then because of that, I recommended that Admiral Aquilino push the investigation to the Department of the Navy to do an assessment on those two items, accountability and liability. The Department of Navy is undertaking that assessment as we speak. So uh, that's the bottom line of what happened and what we're doing to reduce risk. And I'll be happy to take any questions when the time comes up, sir. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, let's uh, move along to the next one. And by the way, these are all basically updates of uh, significant uh, information events since the last November uh, FTAC meeting. Um, I'd like to go uh, now to Dr. William Rice to uh, talk about the Defense Health Agency uh, Clinic. And I appreciate you standing up and to be yeah, visible. Stand up. Thank, Thank you. you see me back here. Um, I'm, I'm Bill Rice. I'm a, a physician, board certified in the specialty of occupational environmental medicine. Sorry about that. Um, I, uh, before being employed by the Defense Health Agency, I served for 31 years with the U.S. Army Medical Department. I have a lot of experience dealing with chemical exposures. Um, I am uh, very excited to be uh, joining this, this, this team of dedicated medical professionals who are committed to providing exceptional care to the members of the community affected by the Red Hill Fuel Storm. Next slide, please. So my colleagues and I truly believe uh, the people who, who say that they are experiencing ongoing symptoms uh, that they attribute to the uh, exposure to the Red Hill fuel spill. And to, to that end, the DHA has established the Red Hill Clinic and has also expanded access to care to include non-TRICARE beneficiaries um, in, 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 for, for care in the Red Hill Clinic. And uh, we were able to do this through a process called secretarial designation. Secretarial de designation, or, or SECDES for short, um, it, it, it uh, allows non-military, non-TRICARE beneficiaries to receive care at the Red Hill Clinic if they meet the two conditions that are on, on this slide. Um, and so I, I encourage you, uh, please, if, if, if you meet these, these um, uh, two, two criteria, Thank you. If you meet these two criteria, uh, I, I highly recommend that you uh, call the number on the slide. Uh, please, please book an appointment. Um, the care that we provide is is uh, an, an initial medical evaluation free of cost, and if if the uh, your symptoms are reasonably attributed to the Red Hill fuel spill, we will. Uh, continue to provide ongoing care, including specialty care, at no cost to you. So please take advantage of this, this resource. Next slide. So these are the numbers of TRICARE rent, or excuse me, of, of uh, patients that we've seen at the Red Hill Clinic since it initially opened in January, and we added the sex devs patients in, in April. Now, um, this, these, these numbers show that um, we have more access to care than we have patients coming to see us. So uh, once again, please um, call the number on the slide, please book an, book an appointment if you meet these criteria. Um, not only do you get a free evaluation, but we also um, can add to the body of knowledge of, of, the, of fuel exposure and what it does to the body. 
Uh, and, and so it's, it's a, a win-win if you, you can come in, get some care, and we can also add to that body of knowledge to learn how to respond to similar situations like this in the future. Next slide, please. So um, we're, we've got some efforts ongoing to, to try to learn more about uh, what, what, um, what fuel in water does to populations such as, as this. And uh, we invited a team from the CDC and the ATSDR to, um, to Oahu, and they sent an 11 person team here to review de identified medical records. They reviewed about uh, 650 of those. Um, and, and when we say that they were de identified, they had no personally identifiable information, such as names, phone numbers, addresses, anything like that, that the, that the reviewers could see. They saw only the medical information in those, in those records. And they are um, currently still going through the analysis of a lot of data. It's going to take take quite a while, but they're they're looking for uh, trends in the reported uh, symptoms and looking for correlations between record, reported symptoms and variables such as gender and age and, and other variables like that. We're also uh, we we um, the DoD has approved. A, an independent third-party registry, and um, we will provide more information as we get through that. We're working through the details right now, and, and so perhaps at our next meeting, I'll have, have more information on that. So thank you for allowing me to uh, present today. Thank you, and uh, we'll have questions, obviously, in just a minute. Let's have the last item. Uh, I'd like to turn to Amy Miller from the EPA, who's going to talk about the uh, new consent order. Okay, so this update is just um, some some basics about um, the, the timeline of, of what's happened with EPA's consent order. So back in uh, December, we um, proposed a, a consent order and we had it open for public comment. And during that time period, we did uh, hold a public meeting and an open house to seek input. Um, we received a significant amount of public uh, comments. We had 1,700 public comments. Each of those comments were reviewed by two EPA staff. We categorized all of the comments into different topics and evaluated them for response. Uh, some of those responses uh, resulted in changes to the consent order, which was finalized last Friday. Others were responded outside um, of the consent order, perhaps um, under the 2015 order on consent or other regulatory actions or some were outside of the scope of uh, uh, EPA's uh, authorities. So I just wanted to highlight a few changes that we did make under the consent order. We are uh, requiring a defueling deadline through um, a, a, a schedule required in the defueling plan 2.0 has to be approved by EPA and will be uh, incorporated and enforced through the order. In addition, uh, we are um, looking to uh, establish a community representation initiative, which will allow for community uh, to be involved in the decision-making process. Uh, and we will be holding an informational session in, in July. Uh, this is uh, community driven. The community gets to decide who is on this, this group and they will meet monthly with uh, the Navy uh, uh, Defense Logistics Agency and EPA concerning um, the actions that are moving forward under the consent order. In addition, uh, we looked to clearly identify uh, local te technical experts who uh, we may want to consult um, on this work under the consent order, and that includes the Board of Water Supply, Hawaii uh, Department of Land and Natural Resources, and the United States Geological Survey. There is also an acknowledgement and a commitment to incorporate perspectives and insights 
of the cultural significance of the aquifer to Native Hawaiians and Hawaii residents into the decision-making process. And lastly, we've enhanced reporting requirements for the Navy and DLA to notify um, through their website, as well as the community representation initiative of any spill that poses an emergency or an immediate threat to human health and to require the post uh, to, to require that data within 24 hours. Uh, if you wanna learn more, we will be hosting next week uh, a webinar June 13th, 5 p.m. to 6.30 p.m. And you can go to our website to learn more about the, the uh, webinar. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And uh, that will be on that calendar of events that we talked about at the very beginning of the meeting, along with other public engagement. Let's move uh, straight to the questions. I'd like to uh, uh, recognize Dr. Noli Lau. Okay, so I know we're short of time, so I'll ask my most pressing question first. How do I get on this community representative representation initiative? I'd like to be one of those 10 people. Thank you for asking the question. And I would like to defer that question to our, our community involvement coordinator, um, uh, Dominique. So uh, the corollary, that means EPA is running this. Well, number one, how do I get on this? Let's start with that. Hi, uh, my name is Dominique Smith. I'm the Environmental Justice and Community Engagement Coordinator uh, for Red Hill. I work with the EPA Region 9. Um, we're gonna be having a scoping meeting on July 27th. More information will come on the location and timing, but with this group, we really want it to be community-led. The uh, members of the group, there will be 10 members, they'll be selected and voted on by the community. Um, during that scoping meeting, we're going to be asking the community, you know, what are the qualifications that the members of this group should have? Um, how can we make sure that there is a representative group that represents the people that have been affected um, by Red Hill releases and who are interested? Um, during that meeting, we're going to be asking you all for input because EPA does not own this group. Um, Navy, DLA does not own this group. It will be independently run by the community. Independently run by what? By community members. And how does the community member assure attendance by all the parties? So EPA will be helping to facilitate the group. We'll be um, helping to man that um, scoping meeting and the informational meeting. The CRI or the Community Representation Initiative will be meeting twice a quarter. And EPA will be joining those meetings to ensure that Navy, DLA, and EPA provide information to the members of that group. There will also be summaries of what's discussed during those meetings and um, agendas posted online so that everyone is aware of what's um, covered during those sessions. So does that mean it's going to be posted on the EPA site or is it? Okay, because I'm thinking that community members who are volunteering do not have the resources to do this. Right, and so, so EPA will be assisting in that process. We will be posting those uh, summaries on our websites, um, on our EPA Red Hill website. Yeah, I noticed that, um, well, first I want to say that there was a response to all the comments, the 1700 comments that you posted and it is on your EPA website. And I found that very useful. If anybody else wants to look at it, I think that's a great site to go to. And you also mentioned at that site that you were going to translate this, the minutes or whatever was found out into different languages, right? That's correct. Okay. Um, it's a priority for EPA to provide information that's accessible to all folks here in Oahu. And so, with our uh, webinars, we've been um, uploading the information, translating documents into Ilocano, Japanese, and Tagalog, which is the top three spoken languages here in Oahu. And so we plan to do the same for the community representation initiative meetings. We plan to translate those minutes into those languages. And then also the community representation initiative can request additional languages um, for those documents to be translated into. I have other questions, but I should try to other people do. Oh, I just want to confirm one thing. The CRI that was talked about will be part of the upcoming webinar. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay, so that's another opportunity to learn more about it. I'm sorry, no, uh, Dr. Lau, do you have another? 
I'm sorry, you just said the CR is part of the EPA website. Is that what you just said? Because I couldn't hear you. The webinar. Well, I'll, I'll webinar. Please. So next week um, on June 13th, we'll have a webinar on the 2023 order. Um, and we will talk more about the consent order during that webinar. Are you going to record it? Because I'm not sure I can attend that one. Yes, all okay. of our Red Hill and Focus webinars are recorded. On okay, that'd be great. Uh, yeah, thank you, Dominique. Uh, if you could, you could stay there, please. I have a question for you and a follow-up question. Uh, you mentioned earlier about uh, trying to be respectful of the cultural significance of Bai in our Native Hawaiian culture, our Kanaka Maoli, and how they 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 cherish and we all do cherish our Bai, our freshwater resources. Could one of the languages that you do the translation in be Ololo Hawaii? Absolutely. Thank you. Okay, any other uh, FTAC members have uh, questions in this topic area? Okay, Ashley Nishihara. Okay, uh, would it be possible to bring back the beneficiaries and secretarial business news slide? The previous the slide by Dr. Rice? Um, the ones that show the numbers of how many people uh, okay. visited the clinic. This one right here? Um, okay. Yeah, you know, um, um, my friend Lois and I, we visited the open house the other day and we saw those numbers and we we're like, that's not very many people. So we we're kind of disturbed by the disconnect with that. So I don't know really who to ask about that because, you know, the people at the booth um, describing this to us, they were like, we don't know either. <laughs> we don't know why. So I'm, I'm guessing that we're probably going to hear, I'm hoping that we'll hear more from the affected families and, and the community, community wide, you know because that number doesn't seem like a lot to me. And um, uh, so I was wondering what the disconnect with that was. And my second- uh, Before before your, that question, can we uh, allow, uh, would you like to respond to that, Dr. Rice? Could you repeat the question? It's about yeah. uh, that the numbers depicted don't seem to be very high relative yeah. to- Yeah, okay. the, the numbers don't seem, high, you know, relative to how many people have been affected. So I was wondering if there was some kind of reason why that was, because that that really is a lot of people, especially in the bottom section. The second the, the, well, the the upper number, that uh, that part of the clinic had been running for several months before the secretarial designation uh, kicked in. Uh, but so, so the numbers in the top part from early January, bottom part of her, from middle of uh, April, so uh, that that partly explains the difference. But but I, if you're asking me to explain why the numbers are low, yeah. um, we we have we haven't done any kind of analysis of, of why that is, and I've got only been speculating. Okay, yeah, that's what I figured. So yeah, without any kind of um, thank you for your response. Yes, and, I, and you know, but, being being low, it does show that we we. We have access to care to provide, uh, and so I'm very glad you brought this up because um, this is. I encourage members of the audience to, to meet those two criteria that were on the previous slide. To, to call call that the the number up and and select option one and, and make an appointment and come come see us. Please. Yeah, yeah, because that makes me those seeing those numbers makes me kind of wonder how accessible this information is and if now like suddenly a lot of people are watching this and go oh i could have done that or, or I, I i could have this you know so yeah so that's all <laughs> and then the thank you and so the the second thing is like you know this tiny tiny step in the right direction however it's not nearly enough so uh i was wondering does the dod intend to fully compensate the impacted families both civilian and service members not just medically but for living expenses relevant to the contamination as well. Okay. Um, leave it to you to respond. Just, since I'm the senior DOD representative here, let me just answer this. So what you just asked is a policy question. It's a fair question, but we here can't answer that. So just like the last FTAC, when we knew that there were gaps in policy with respect to reservists and guards, men and women that couldn't get access to care, and that there were civilians on the Navy water distribution system that couldn't get medical access. I pushed that up my chain of command. I would do the same thing. 
And then I would encourage you and any others to uh, communicate with your elected officials, especially at the federal level. Uh, they are very influential, as you know, and uh, would uh, also, in parallel, uh, uh, submit a, potentially submit a request to the Department of Defense. Okay. Um, oh. Uh, Dr. I, I have a corollary actually to Ashley's question. Your numbers show that 123 patients were seen and 653 medical records were reviewed. Does that mean 653 people's charts were reviewed and only 123 showed up for care? Yeah, um, so those are two. Um, so they reviewed 650 medical records from our medical system. So that includes uh, people who were seen prior to the establishment of the Red Hill Clinic, so they may have been seen anywhere in our system, including Tripler. So what happened to the other 400 people? Uh, they, were, they were seen outside of the Red Hill Clinic, so they were seen in other parts of our uh, military health system here on the island. Okay, and, and and so it was it was um, you know pre pre January of this year. Well, I guess one of the comments is that by the time you stood up the clinic, a lot of people probably PC um, what's it called PCS away, so you probably lost track of them. Um, and so, are you trying to track them down at their new stations and keep keep you know examining them? So, so I'm sorry, what is your question? Um, a lot of the people have gone away. They've been stationed away. So how are you following up on them and making sure they're having care and their complaints taken seriously? Yeah, yeah so, okay. So, so people with, within the military health system? Right. Yeah, so, so you're, you're correct. It is, it is a mobile population. So if you're, if you're PCSing every, you know, moving every three years, theoretically every three, the third of your population moves you know, every, every year. So, so you're absolutely correct. Um, so um, they, many of those stay with, within our system, assuming that they're not retiring or getting out, out of the military. Um, we have uh, really a, a, a few ways to address this. So um, uh, providers are generally aware of what occurred here um, and they have a uh, really a wealth of resources to, to back up on. We have a, a, a robust uh, defense public health uh, uh, system and to include uh, uh, others in, in my specialty that, that they can, uh, that providers can reach out to. Uh, there are also local um, occupational medicine physicians typically at each of the installations, or not each installation, but many of the installations. And so they can reach out uh, to them, them locally. Um, we're also um, going to be having very soon a, um, a continuing, medical evaluation, continuing medical education program. It's gonna be about four hours in length um, that covers, covers Red Hill. And um, uh, so that'll be accessible to the providers across across our system. Yeah, um, I forget what it was called, but I know I think Diane Felton put it together, or she was involved with it. Um, there was a seminar that was online, and there were a bunch of military doctors, et cetera, as well as her, and anybody in the community who was interested to sign up for it. And I did, and I listened to a case study, and it was helpful and useful, but. A lot of people did, including the people from the military, say that it's kind of too bad. People have moved away and they're not getting their complaints taken seriously because of this lack of information. So it's nice you're going to put this webinar together, but it's already like a couple years late, um, which could also account for why there's only nine civilians who decided to take part in your clinic. So you were wondering why I'm giving you a little bit of a comment here. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I think this would be a good time to pause. We've gone obviously about a half hour late, uh, but it was important obviously. Uh, so what I'd like to do is uh, invite you all to take a well-deserved 10 minute break. Um, for those in 
the audience here, two things. Of course, the restrooms are up at the top. And if you uh, would like to uh, sign up to ask a question or a comment, please remember uh, that there's a sign-in sheet for that. People will be ta taken in the order they're called. When we reconvene, I'll talk about like how we're going to try to move everybody down who wants to speak so we can make that happen efficiently. If you are online as a webinar um, participant, um, as soon as we go on the break, uh, that's the time when uh, you'll be able to start to raise your hands to be recognized as well. So um, again, you'll be uh, called in the order uh, that you appear in the queue. And just to let you know, um, we will be going back and forth in a few in the audience here in person asking, then a few on Zoom, then back again for a few in the audience. So we'll work it that way. But uh, by all means, let's have a nice uh, 10 minute break. Thank you.
the time between speakers less. So I have uh, Francis Nakamoto, Susan Cola Davis, Lono, Susan Gorman Chang, Kevin O'Leary, Chandra Kanamaru, Patricia Beekman, Colonel Ann Wright, Jason Alexander. Um, I'm sorry, I might be missing the first name here. Oh, Eric Blanco, Tara Rojas, Noel Shaw, and Garner, Garner Shimizu. So if you can take a seat, be comfortable. And then um, for the uh, uh, Zoom participants, I see some have raised their hands already. Um, so we'll be, again, going back and forth between the in-person audience and the Zoom audience. Um, and I think everybody is back from our uh, speakers and FTAC members. So, um, you know, just a, a, a quick reminder. Um, fortunately, I mean, unfortunately, we went over uh, a little bit, but I think we can, uh, you know, uh, given the size of the crowd, I think we can um, have a good uh, question and comment period for you at this point. I really thank you for all of your patience. Uh, meetings can be long, but uh, um, this is important stuff. Um, what we'll do is just kind of give you a sense. Um, when you are speaking here in the audience, please stand up. The microphone should be live, um, but make sure as you're speaking that um, you're kind of close enough because it's not just the audience in here that hears you, but on television and, uh, and online. Um, and then that little camera in the front there, uh, which you can hardly see, will be uh, showing your face. Uh, to uh, the broadcast group as well. Um, we'll kind of go back and forth between the two different areas. If anybody uh, is wanting to ask a question and has um, is unable to walk down the stairs, please let us know. We have a wireless mic that will be brought to you. Um, we have uh, timekeepers on both sides, uh, and that's just so we can help uh, try to uh, uh, advise you when one and a half minutes is gone and then two. So there will be a yellow uh, sign when it's one and a half minutes, approximately 30 seconds left. And uh, the red when it's uh, basically your uh, time is over. Um, I, I do always need to uh, emphasize that the purpose of this is just to share the airspace. You know, it's nothing worse than that. Um, everybody, you know, has a lot that they would like to say, but just try to make sure that we distribute it as well as we can. Uh, and you can always be very impactful um, in a very short period of time. Uh, I know many of you are, you realize that. Um, with our Zoom uh, participants, it will be the same thing when you get called upon, uh, except in your case, uh, you will be automatically promoted to what's called a panelist. And then uh, you will be asked to unmute your microphone and, uh, you, and speak, and you will be visible <clears throat> on the big screen to the audience if you have your camera on. Uh, so that's basically how it will work. And um, you, know, you will be able to ask questions directly of uh, the individuals who spoke uh, this earlier in the program. Uh, so without further ado, I think that covers pretty much everything. I'd like to take the first group from within the audience. And I'd like to ask uh, Francis Nakamoto um, if you could stand up. Thank you, sir. And if you wanna come down and move that podium forward, it might be easier uh, for you. I don't want anybody falling off the step. Thank you. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. I wanna apologize, I have a frog in my throat, but I'll try to be as clear as possible. Uh, one issue that hasn't been discussed too much today is uh, independent testing, especially by an independent local laboratory. Uh, I've always wondered why uh, the Department of Health has not pushed on this matter of doing their own independent testing, or maybe I may be wrong. Uh, I'd like to find out, first of all, whether the D Department of Health does do its independent testing or whether it's relying upon the Navy. And secondly, why isn't the BWS involved in testing since it is primarily responsible for water quality in the state of Hawaii? I heard some good news today that Dr. Lau, uh, Mr. Lau mentioned that there's a possibility 
that the board of water supply may be allowed in. But that has been, I think, a serious defect in the testing policy here for Red, Red Hill. We need to get more people involved in testing, not only the Navy, and it has to be independent to make sure that the people of Hawaii trust the results. And that leads to my next question. Why not a local independent laboratory here to be allowed to test quickly, test independently, and get the, and get the results when it's worth anything, instead of waiting a few days for results to come back from the mainland? So that's my question. Um, okay. I guess DOH can answer first. Thank you. I'm going to call up my drinking water branch chief to address part of your question regarding the uh, independent lab testing. Uh, we do have our staff overseeing the collection of the samples. Um, and so I'd like to also send it first to um, Sarah Moody of the Navy and then um, bring up my branch chief. Thank you. Okay, um, I'm going to uh, ask you to just repeat the question about the testing uh, that was uh, for him. Okay, sorry. Thank you for your question. Um, so all of our testing is done through a third party contractor. And while that is not maybe of the perspective of independent, it is done with the purpose of creating accountability so that the results can be validated outside of the Navy. So the results, so the, the samples are collected by a third party contractor. DOH is present to observe the sampling. It's sent to the mainland to an EPA certified lab. And then the data is uploaded into a data management system that the Navy does not have control over. Everyone has equal access to that data management system. So that the same time that we get access to the data, the regulators get access to the data. And that creates a level of accountability because this is such a large sampling feat. That was the best way we could um, do 7,800 samples over two years with the labs that we have available. We have provided lab equipment to the University of Hawaii for them to work towards what options can be available on here on island. And we see that as a valuable thing to pursue. It's just not something we have in place right now. And I'm gonna ask if Joanna could rephrase the question that was directed to Dennis and you can tell us if that matches what you were asking. The question was related to why DOH does not do its own testing, is that correct? Um, well, if it's for testing for TPH, TPH is an unregulated um, compound for drinking water. And our lab, our current lab at um, our state laboratory division does not have the capability to test for TPH. That's why it's, it has to go outside. As the Navy mentioned, the uh, UH is providing some online capability to do that. Um, in, in the case of PFAS testing, um, I'm getting ahead of myself, but uh, for PFAS, for example, it will be a regulated con contaminant. Um, our state laboratory division is uh, beginning to purchase equipment and, and have that um, online capability because we will be providing that, um, that service for our public water systems. Um, currently, our, our role in LTN is to provide oversight. Um, so because of our limited staffing levels, we, uh, you know, the, the most efficient use of our staff is to make sure that the sample is um, collected properly. And most of the times when you see our compromised sample is it, it's attributed to how the sample was collected and not necessarily the, the, the lab process because these labs that the, the Navy has um, procured, they have been validated through um, for drinking water standards under our, um, our uh, certification, but they also um, are going through uh, level two and four validation. And so um, our oversight is with the actual process of collecting the sample as well as um, looking through the data that is provided to us and then um, evaluating that data. Okay. Can I ask a quick follow-up? 
Um, if it's really quick, because we've got a lot of other people. Okay, well, what about the lack of a local laboratory? Because now all the samples are being sent to the mainland, and there are times in the past that it's taken several weeks to get the result. And with the emergence of PFAS, you need the results immediately in order to warn the population. So why not push? Why not DOH? You're the regulators. Push for independent local testing. Thank you for that. The push for independent testing would be done with laboratories on island. However, they would also be going through the same process to be certified uh, to conduct those tests. So for the TPH uh, contaminant, uh, as Dennis mentioned, it's not regulated. There's also a process that would need to be followed in order for the lab to be uh, certified. So that process is um, extensive and there are um, things that we need to do for the lab or the lab needs to do for certification that they have not been able to do at this point. Um, and that would be for the current independent labs on island, other independent labs. Thanks. Okay, um, let's take another uh, question from the in-house audience, uh, Susan Bacola Davis. I have no questions. I just have good stuff to say. Yesterday's community meeting and the previous one done by F, uh, not FTAC, sorry, Red Hill Task Force was very enlightening for me. Aloha, my name is Susan Pacola Davis. I have spent countless hours researching valves in order to provide you with a document that takes you through some of the various reports I've and I've only focused on valves. And if you wanna read that document, it will be under the written testimony from this meeting. I think it is important to understand the past in order to go forward in the near future. And that is why I spent those countless hours to understand what happened so that I understand what's going to happen. In the past two weeks, I've had the pleasure of meeting and talking in depth with Red Hill Task Force. At no time was there any hesitance in any of their responses. Enthusiasm and pride were humbly disguised. What keeps me awake at night? The valves. But I also got some very fair answers, one being the unknown. Uh, two of the Red Hill Task Force members that I spoke with was Amanda and Steve. Steve spent a lot of time with me going through things, even asked me if I was an engineer. I said, no, I'm a researcher. I have every confidence that the defueling will be done in the safest manner. This was like night and day from what I have experienced in the past with talking to people that are in control of this whole system. Admiral Wade has also spent time talking with me and I can assure you, assure you he knows every facet of every plan that will be taking place. The Red Hill Task Force subject matter experts can also talk about other aspects of the work ahead and also direct you to a point person. I agree that you cannot plan for every scenario because there's still unknown things too that could be found out. It's unexpected, things can happen. However, they have built redundancies into the operations to quickly address any an issue and a stop. And believe me, I questioned and questioned and I believe everything that I heard. I also spent time with the Department of Health staff talking about valves and I got to speak with Joanna and Dennis and some other people that I can't remember their names, but they were very willing to talk with me. How serious, my expectation are, are that everyone has the same playbook on the same page. How serious are valves to drinking water distribution system? I'll say Admiral Wade says not one drop, and I say not one valve. 
Uh, Ms. Davis, uh, I, I don't want to interrupt you uh, inappropriately, but if it's a long statement, would you no. feel better uh, just... Uh, if you would have just given me my last breath, I would have finished. Thank you. I'm sorry. <laughs> so if anybody ever asks me what document would be the most important document to read, it would be the Department of Defense Red Hill Defueling Plan Supplement 2. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, um, let's move to uh, the next speaker signing up, Loro. Um, hi, I just wanted to say thank you for everyone here. I got to talk to a lot of people um, that's on the task force now. I think everybody wished they were here five years ago. And uh, I feel very confident that they have the heart to serve the people. So God bless you and your families. And I pray for your success in this endeavor. Uh, I wanted to say a quote from Patsy Mink, one of my heroes. Uh, I believe there's still hope in our country that we, we do not need to be content with mediocrity, that we have the right to hitch our, um, right to hitch our stars in the, to the heavens and strive for excellence, that we have the innate goodness to recognize evil and demagoguery and see that right shall overcome all obstacles and succeed. I believe all this because you are and you must be the hope if the nation is to resemble in our future what it set out to be 200 years ago. Um, in 1969, the National Environmental Policy Act passed Congress. In January the following year, Nixon signed on to law and later in December, EPA became official under his reorganization plan. In 1986, the Emergency Response and Right to Know Act was established. The EPA has a document 550F00004, updated March 2000, which under Sirica Section 103 um, identifies the um, chemical, uh, chemical emergency response. Um, there's even Executive Order 1286 on exposure to children signed by Clinton. And I point these things out because in the consent order that uh, I believe the EPA has correctly identified the state and local authorities have not um, acted sufficiently. However, my concern is that the EPA is not um, holding to task what things have done and people who need to be taken care of. So I please um, ask you guys to reconsider that. There's a lot of people who are suffering and there's already been laws prior to the 2015, I'll finish that up, 2015 or the current uh, agreement to consent. And uh, it's no reflection on the people who are working on it now, but those people need to be taken care of. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and uh, let's take one more from the in-house audience, uh, Susan Gorman Chang. If I wanna make sure the mic is on, it might be turned off. Uh -oh. <laughs> Can I just hold it? It's on. Yeah. yeah. Uh, mahalo for allowing me to ask my questions. I'm Susan from the Chetan Red Hill Coalition. And I just have some questions about the seven scenarios of the worst case scenarios that Admiral Wade brought up. Uh, my questions are this Did you consult with MCAS Miramar at the San Diego facility? Uh, they also defueled their underground jet fuel uh, storage tanks. And did you consult with any people outside of the military or your contractors when you came up with these um, seven worst case scenarios? Well, thanks for your question. Uh, absolutely. So uh, we have uh, worked through the entire Department of Defense enterprise because we have shut down bulk fuel storage facilities, but we've done nothing like this under the ground, nothing built inside of a mountain. And because of that, we also reached out to industry globally via the De Defense Logistics Agency who has contacts with all petroleum-based firms throughout the world. So we're calling best practices, um, uh, lessons learned, what have you, to inform our plans, not only for the actual defueling, but also our response. So the bottom line is yes. So, so there were people outside of the military consultant. That's correct. Okay, thank you. And I have just one other quick question. Um, you you uh, talked about 
the contractors you said the Navy should have had greater oversight over the contractors in regards to the AFFF spill. Is the Navy still using this same contractor who made those two big mistakes? So the company in question that uh, uh, improperly installed the valve and also uh, did not disable the pumps uh, is still under Navy contract. Uh, that contractor is still performing uh, preventative maintenance. This is exactly why I have asked through my chain of command for the Navy to review uh, questions on liability and accountability because this is a Navy facility. It's a Navy contract. I know I'm a Naval officer. It's probably very confusing for the community, but my chain of command is through U.S. Indo-Pacific Command and to the Secretary of Defense. So the Department of the Navy must make that determination. And as I said, uh, my request has been uh, accepted and the Department of Defense is reviewing uh, the liability and accountability for that contractor. Now, I understand that. I don't know why that wouldn't be grounds for breaking the contract or we would have written in the contract that if they did something so egregious, the contract would be over. That's a great question. And that, that that's why the Department of Navy is looking at that. Now, let me just highlight, though, that on December 6th, when my duties and responsibilities were expanded, I now provide centralized oversight of the entire facility. So I understand even though, that, sir. I understand. Yeah, so, so while kinetics, when they do do this maintenance, I review it. And to be honest with you, I've kicked back some of the procedures until I was satisfied that it was going to be conducted safely. Great. Thank you. One other very quick question. Sure. If a contractor does something like this in the future, will the EPA find the contractor or do they can, can they only find the Navy? I'm sorry, I, I couldn't hear the last part. Will the EPA find a contractor? Find the contractor. Can you find the contractor or do you have to only find the Navy? You were saying you were going to hold them accountable, you know, with penalties and whatnot. What happens if it's not, quote, the Navy, it's their contractor? So our agreement is with the Navy and Defense Logistics Agency. So any agent of the Navy or Defense Logistics agency, Navy would be accountable along with the defense logistics agency. Okay, so someone would pay the penalty. If they do not comply with the terms of the consent order, uh, they could potentially be subject to a stipulated penal penalty. Thank you. Okay, thank, thank you very you. much. Um, we're going to now move to uh, some people on Zoom. So, um, the first one is Maheshi Hay. I'm sorry if I mispronounced your name. Um, and you're going to get a prompt to unmute. Um, Maheshi Hay is not responding. OK, um, then we'll move to the next one. Um, sorry. I'm very aware that it was forming me at the same time. Did you have me next? Uh, and uh, there was always this dynamic. Aloha. I have a, a comment that I would like to make. Um, um, if I could just, so we're having some um, chatter that we can't understand your question. Yeah, I'm going to turn that down just a minute. Yeah, well, we'll wait. Your time doesn't okay. start until we. Okay. I have a comment and I have two very quick questions. Um, I want to I want to state the obvious that the military and the Navy is in Oahu for um, defense purposes, for our uh, safety, for the country. And if we have no drinking water, nobody lives on this island. It's a dead island, and so we have no defense system. We have no strategic safety. So I, want, I would like all of those who are making decisions on this to keep this foremost in your mind, in the uppermost of your mind, that this is really, we're talking about a matter of life and death, really. That's what water is. Without water, there's no life. And so keep this at the forefront 
of all of you who are making decisions. Now, my question specifically for the DOD is this, uh, you've already admitted that you've made a lot of mistakes. So I would say this incompetence, this oversight, this neglect, whatever you want to call it, has cost Oahu taxpayers money. Are you going to be reimbursing the people of Oahu for this catastrophe? Okay, thank you for that uh, question. Uh, I will leave that to the Navy. You want to respond to that? This is uh, Vice Admiral Wade. Thank you for your, your feedback. It's greatly appreciated. Uh, I, I hear your uh, question. That's a question, unfortunately, that we can't answer here. Uh, we can talk about defueling, closure, and environmental remediation and medical. It's a valid question, a valid concern, but that is a policy question that we can't answer here. Who can answer that? Because I've heard that answer a lot during this meeting. We can't answer that here. And isn't this meeting for us to get answers to our questions? It is, and, and, and my intent is to answer every question that I can. But your question there is, is a policy question. Everyone here who's working our respective missions, which is so important for you and the community, we're, we're executing policy. So my promise to you and to everyone here is that when there's a policy question that I can't answer, I will push that up my chain of command. That may not be satisfying to you, but that's the well, that's best a, I it's, can a, do. it's a start. I have one more quick question, and this well, is for uh, whomever can answer it. When all this is done and it's cleaned up, is the Red Hill area and all areas around it going to be returned to the state of Hawaii so that we can take care of our water, our drinking water, because the Navy will have no longer have any need for it? Will that be returned back to us? And before you answer that, um, I would just like to advise you to actually face okay. the cameras here because okay. uh, she can see you better that way. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, Ma'am, I understand your a question. Uh, right now, our singular focus is on to protect the environment and protect public health and also um, supporting the JTF as they defuel and then also as we, uh, we the Navy, proceed to close. What I will also tell you um, is that... Um, Key to this process is the continued remediation uh, that's going to be uh, going on well after closure. So we have a lot of work that we have to do for that. We're working with our regulators to making sure that we do take care of the land, and the water, the air, and just take care of our community. So right now, that's not a focus of that. It's just uh, defueling and closing and taking care of the environment. But I, okay, I can that be put? Can that be put on your agenda to go up your chain of command because? The, yes, the, 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 the safety of the water should be in the hands of the state of Hawaii, not the Navy, yes. not the military, not anybody else. Yes, Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, let's move on to our next person in uh, the uh, order of the Zoom queue. And uh, before uh, you start, uh, if any of the Zoom people have background noise, uh, if you could make sure that that is not loud, that will help uh, everybody uh, to understand your question better. Um, so Kathleen McClanahan. Yes, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. My name is Catherine McClanahan and I continue with others struggling with symptoms since Red Hill. I have since, I have several comments and four quick questions. Seven months ago, I testified before you in case you don't remember, I asked for a simple, easily digestible toxin list that families could provide to our doctors. We never received such a list. So families testified and requested the same from the Hawaii Department of Health and EPA. I wanna thank the EPA for providing the chemicals of potential concern list of 2016. Most of us had it already, but especially also the Department of Health for their memo of February, 2023 with a summary table that provides our doctors a starting place to view our exposure between May in December of 2021. If you're in the auditorium, it is that table that is being held up for you to see. 
While the DOH memo with summary table is a good starting point, you will notice the last row in table three states, not available or unknown. In case you wonder why, it's because even the Hawaii Department of Health has been unable to receive the necessary information from the Navy regarding Simple Green in order for them to complete their studies to help families and doctors. So here we are again today, our families continue having to testify and essentially beg for information and help after you exposed us to dangerous toxins. But over the last year and a half, we continue finding out that much was hidden from us. For months from November of 2021 through March 22, Navy leaders touted transparency and encouraging water results during your daily town halls, but you failed to mention the antifreeze was of concern. An antifreeze test result of December 2027, December 27th, 2021 showed 32,000 parts per billion. While initial lab reports were dated 20, December 27th, the final report was mysteriously delayed with multiple date changes and finally dated and reported April 4th, 2022. And our families now know that the Navy and Defense Logistic Agency had successfully dropped antifreeze testing from long-term monitoring tests in 2016. So we may never know what the levels of antifreeze were from May of 21 to December 17th, the day that the sample was drawn of 2021. While our doctors were struggling to understand what was happening to our bodies, the Navy buried or delayed for over three months results that showed exactly why I quote for you several doctor's notes from different Red Hill families. Patient reports feeling drunk. Episode at lunchtime was associated with general fatigue. In case you don't have time to research health effects, antifreeze or fuel system icing inhibitor as you call it causes drowsiness and signs of inebriation, decreased level of consciousness, headache and seizures. Our doctors could have used that information from about the antifreeze to help us. If the Navy really wants to right the wrong as you have claimed, protect us from those within your own ranks that lack the integrity to do the right thing. Care enough to be honest with us. Throughout the country, families have moved off island so we read your care. So here are my four questions. I know my time is up. Yes, that's, that's I have four when that. questions. When will the Navy provide the Y Department of Health the necessary information regarding Simple Green? When will any federal agency provide a summary list of the medical effects known or suspected from every chemical used in and around Red Hill? When will the DOD assemble the best toxicologists in the country, both civilian and military to aid our families? And if no agency is willing to provide such medical assistance, please tell me when I might receive a phone call explaining why that information and that assistance from a known toxic exposure caused by the United States Navy is not available to families who serve this country, nor the civilians who support them or live on the water Navy waterline. And finally, number four to the EPA, HGOH and CDC. When can you provide us an updated health advisory memo that families can share with our off-island doctors? Since we have no other access to medical care or expertise, we need that updated memo to further assess and aid our getting better. I appreciate your time and I would appreciate any chance to have those answered. Okay, thank you. So uh, we have a few questions for the Navy uh, and then one for uh, EPA DOH. So uh, Navy, if you proceed first. Thank, Thank you for your question. Uh, regarding the simple green, I will do my research on that. It was my understanding that this information had been passed, but um, let me uh, dig a little bit further into that and, I, and I'll take that as a, uh, as a do out uh, for me. Thank you. Okay. Um, and now EPA and DOH, any comment? So we are still waiting, uh, reviewing data, and for the de-icing, uh, the testing has been going on since 2016, as far as the groundwater monitoring program is concerned. So we are still in the process of reviewing the data. So any okay. chance that there could be a he updated health advisory? Because how, how long do we have to wait? So in order to develop the health advisory, we need to complete the review of the data. That's been going on since 2016? No, this is the recent data of information that we've been uh, requesting. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and I'm glad we were able to get to all four of your questions. Um, 
Let me uh, now turn it over to uh, bring up Jamie Simic. We'll take one more uh, online and then we'll go back to the in-house audience. Jamie, are you able to unmute? Hello, how are you guys doing today? My name is Thank Jamie Smick. I appreciate you guys holding this town hall or advisory committee. With the recent proclamation signed, I'm gonna piggyback off of the end of cat there and ask for you guys to consider changing the DOH advisory. You've been touting that you need years to gather the data since 2014. I now have a nine-year-old daughter that started losing control of her bowels on island. We all do. Last night, she lost control of her bowels. She has to wear a pull-up every night. I have to wash the sheets sometimes two, three times a day. These symptoms aren't fleeting. If I reach behind here with my files, these are the labs that I asked for in December from my PCM. I was told they don't exist. I was told TRICARE wouldn't cover it. Just give me a referral. I'll get it done myself. TRICARE doesn't cover it. My son has blisters in his mouth right now that he's had since he was on island. The only thing that is helping us get care right now is Dr. Brewer's advisory letter. We need that DOH letter changed in order for us to get care because it links with the CDC that also links with every state department of health in the nation. You have service members spread out all over. We also need the list of exposures so we can protect ourselves from ever being exposed again or from what I call happening, from what happens over and over, which I call relapse because I don't have a definition for it, because I can't get a PCM, because nobody wants to help, because I continue to advocate. When is the right thing gonna be done? And at this point, it'll lead up to the comment with the clinic. Who wants to go to a clinic that you guys promised for over a year? And then you open up late. If you look at the numbers that you just presented for that Red Hill Clinic, not even half were sent out for specialty care. When you're exposed to these horrendous chemicals, you need specialty care. You need functional medicine. You need a whole team. And the way that this is being handled is stopping the victims who did not choose this path from acquiring a whole team to see the whole picture. I've asked for the DOH letter to be changed since last year. I've asked for the EPA to put in harsher guidelines on that. I've asked for the CDC to link up nationally. We didn't even know that the CDC was coming out to review our records. Even though it's anonymous, there needs to be better transparency and there needs to be oversight but most importantly, you need to help and take care of those that you hurt through contaminating the why. Because it doesn't okay, just affect those that left the Is island. there a question you would like to direct towards anybody in particular at this point? It's, I was gonna piggyback, I was asking about the DOH as I stated, I'm picking back off a of cat okay. in order to give you a comment, to give you a real testimony of what is truly happening to the affected families. So you can get a real picture. I'm going to find out at the end of the month if my daughter is needing eye surgery again. When is enough enough? Okay, would you like DOH to respond to the I would like question? the DOH and the Navy 
to respond because the Navy, it's the lack of communication and the advisory is going back and forth because when I was in Tripler Hospital December 6th, the DOH and the Navy and the CDC were communicating on how not to treat me and how not okay. to test me. We need so to change that there, there and we, uh... start testing because there is lab testing, there's urine testing, there's blood testing. By you not testing, you have stopped care. I have testing from March of this year that shows horrendous levels in the 75 and 95th percentile for my children and I, but we if still- I could just ask you to pause there, can we allow the, the, maybe Dr. Rice or uh, DOH if they want to respond? to uh, the questions you asked. That way we can you know, help uh, move along and hopefully you get some um, more information. So I just Dr. Rice, you guys do you have any response? Otherwise, if it's, it's, if it's a comment, we, we can leave it at that point and move on. And, and of course, you can always submit longer uh, comments uh, in written form. It's not just a comment, it's a plea. It's a plea. Okay for you guys to do the right thing because these symptoms aren't fleeting. And unless you properly detox, every day it's doing damage to the organs. Okay. Um, Especially at the levels that we were at. And when will we lower the EAL levels? Not down to 95. Right, so let, let, not let's down pause to there because there's a lot of content that I just want to, if there's a response, we can take it at this point. Otherwise, in the interest of fairness and time, we should move on to the other people who also want to um, to speak and ask questions because we have them all here today. So it's time to get some answers. Is there any response you'd like to offer? Is any? Go ahead. Specifically about testing? Please, I guess, yes. Why won't the Navy, the DOH, and the EPA give us a new health memo? You've admitted that there's harm. You admitted that you caused damage. Why won't there be a new memo for testing? Why won't we lower these EAL levels? We knew 50 was too high in 2014. Okay, so let's just pause there since you asked some questions. You don't have... A Okay, so uh, I'll pitch it back to DOH at this point if you have a, a response to that. And then we'll, in, uh, in fairness to others, we'll have to move on after that. Thank you. I mentioned earlier the Data is still being reviewed, and we are looking at uh, making sure that we can make the change. You said that for two years. We have new new samples that we are looking at. Uh, the data from those samples. You knew are being fifty reviewed. was too high. You knew a hundred was too high. Okay, so in in the interest of time, I'm sorry. We we, we really. Do. I know. I and, appreciate and, and it. You can always follow up on, with with the written comments, but we have many other I people who've already. I appreciate it and I appreciate okay. your time and I appreciate everybody working on this. This isn't just Thank life you. or death for me and my children. It's life and death for so many others. And you have new people every day posting about new symptoms and you have new exhibit A's being made. Change the DOH letter so people can get better. That's all I'm asking for. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you very much. much. And well, let's, let's go, go to, to the, the next um, speaker in the Zoom queue. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Uh, Marty Townsend, and then after uh, Marty Townsend, we'll go back to the uh, audience here. Is she unmuting? I'm sorry, it's taking a little bit longer than we thought to get people un unmuted. Okay, Marty. Hi, my name is Marty Townsend. I'm testifying on behalf of the Sierra Club of Hawaii. We've been following this issue for 
uh, many years and uh, we'll offer these comments in the hope to uh, advance uh, better protections for Oahu's water supply and, Hawaii, and Oahu's population. Um, we have six points to make. One, uh, we call for decommissioning of the tanks completely, no reuse. The risk is just simply too high and the trust is not there. Um, two, the immediate financial relief for affected families um, and other relief as well, if you have heard the previous testimony, um, people who are directly affected by the Navy's negligence and the negligence of their contractors um, are suffering still and uh, they need relief. And financial relief is just the minimum next step to take. Um, next, we want full remediation of our aquifer. Um, my concern is that we will see uh, this Red Hill water crisis follow the same path as Koho'olawe, where the people of Hawaii are left um, with the responsibility of cleaning up the military's mess. The Navy does not have a good track record, um, and we need to see a commitment to a full remediation of our aquifer. Um, they, are, they cannot leave until it is uh, all cleaned up. Um, and I'm talking about the fuel as well as the uh, forever chemicals. Um, four, we want proper monitoring and perpetuity of the aquifer. Um, the entire aquifer and the and the the land around it is contaminated. Um, and uh, we, you know, we are in un unprecedented times. Uh, we are dealing with an unprecedented situation, and uh, we need full and complete monitoring. Um, it, you know, I'm. I'm glad you guys are putting in more monitoring wells. Should have, could have done that years ago. And, um, you know, the fact that we are falling so far behind um, on managing this crisis is extremely disappointing. Um, we want number five, full transparency and accountability. Um, I appreciate that the military has taken um, a lot of effort to appear transparent, both at the open house yesterday and in today's presentations. But reality is, is that compared to the amount of information that was made available without asking um, after the 2014 link uh, and what we have available now, um, it's not comparable. Uh, the military is not being as um, forthright and straightforward um, as it could be. And, uh, and that's frankly just unacceptable. I mean, your concerns about liability do not register on the list of considerations um, about what should be released and who should know what when. Um, full transparency um, is the minimum expectation. And the fact that we have to ask for that still this far along in this, in this um, crisis um, just goes to um, show, justify uh, the lack of trust uh, that the people have for the U.S. military and their contractors. And six, um, in the effort of ensuring um, more accountability, um, we would like to uh, see an expansion in public meetings. Um, you know, these kinds of get-togethers are um, extremely important in sharing and understanding information, um, and they are just held too infrequently. Um, there's a lot of, um, you know, effort put into these meetings um, in terms of, like, the show of what we're doing, but, uh, you know, if we met more often, uh, we could have shorter meetings, um, less pomp and circumstance, um, and more actual dialogue. Um, and so uh, I, we have submitted our written testimony um, to the regulators and to the regulated, and uh, you can read our um, testimony in more detail there. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, Mark. Okay, okay, let's, let's return, return to the uh, in-house audience here. Um, and I'd like to ask Kevin O'Leary. You might wanna make sure the mic is on too. Yes, hopefully yeah. it's on. Thank yeah, you. I just have two quick things. Um, I haven't been following this since 2015, only since about 2017, so five years, and many meetings. Um, one thing we never heard of, just on a quick back backup, is we never heard anything about the pipes. It was all about the tanks for years, never about the pipes. The pipe system now is, uh, you know, a source of concern. My first question is, does the Navy have any current um, data about how many pukas or problems you have discovered in the pipes in getting them ready to drain the pipes? Okay, so obviously they're as old as the tanks. And if you check them out and they didn't look too good or they worried you, what are the results of that? How many repairs have you made? 
And that's my first question. My second one is very brief. I was surprised to hear that DOH came up with the idea of the repurposing, that they brought it up. Um, how is the repurposing of the pipes in any way the DOH is Kuleana? What do they care? Well, you know, did somebody suggest that to you and you suggested it? And then just a simple question. Why did you bring it up? of all the agencies who'd be interested. And that's my two questions. Thank okay, thank, thank you very much. So we have one question to the Navy and then the second question to DOH. So uh, Navy, if you could go first. So thank you very much for your question. That this is for Joint Task Force Red Hill because the repairs, the enhancements and the modifications to safely to fuel are part of my uh, job jar. So uh, I don't have the specific numbers of pipeline repairs, but I can get that for you. And I'll take that down as a do out and I'll work it through the team here. But there were 253 repairs that were mandated from the state emergency order that was reviewed by a third party engineering firm. The preponderance of the repairs for the pipelines were not actually the, the pipelines itself. And again, I'll get you the specifics, but foundational corrosion uh, and uh, uh, where the pipelines would go through a, um, a transition through the, uh, uh, the facility, through a, um, a metal structure, there may be some rust. So we'll get you those specific numbers, but uh, uh, that's what we're talking about here largely. Uh, there's also repairs to uh, some valves. There's also, uh, from the lessons learned when we had uh, in May, the surge event where we had an air pocket that led to the, the, the spill, there was no way to monitor the pressures that were building. So we've installed transducers that now can measure the pressure within the pipelines to help us with our more exacting procedures. So I thank you for the question. Uh, I will get you the specifics on those pipeline repairs so you have that and we'll make it available on the public. We'll put it on our website and we'll put it on our app. So thank you. And second, uh, DOH. Thank you for that question. The state's solid waste management priorities consider the following hierarchy, source reduction and reuse, recycling before disposal. So based on the state solid waste laws, uh, we need to follow those. And being that there is historical value of the facility, we believe that it's appropriate to consider possible reuse options prior to disposal. Okay. Well, if, if you could just ask a quick follow-up, did, did you want to just clarify? So it's, we need to look at recycling before disposal. So this is primarily um, from our solid waste management priorities. Um, let's see. I'm going to call up my solid and hazardous waste branch, solid waste um, section supervisor. Solid waste supervisor? Uh, this is Lene Ichino. Okay, somebody else is coming out to help answer that question. Oh, so chapter um, Hawaii by statutes, chapter 342G identifies the state's solid waste hierarchy in which we are required to look at prior to disposal. And so that's a consideration that needs to be, uh, should be done, but not necessarily um, have to be done, I guess. It, it's, it's kind of the reduce, reuse, recycle um, is, uh, issue that we want to pers um, pursue as far as uh, environmental protection um, management strategy. Okay. Um, okay, if it could be real quick, thank you. But how, how is the reuse of this facility as it's designed. In other words, you want to reuse a, a facility that's only been used for fuel 
how can you guys at DOE, DOH reuse it in any way that won't have to do with you? So we, we recognize the historical nature of the facility. So, you know, one thought could be, and I think Nakapuna had mentioned that some of the input that they received from, from the public was non-liquid reuse. So that's a possibility that could occur. Um, you know, um, you know, it's a museum of sorts is, is the one option. So it's a consideration to be made before a decision is, uh, is rendered. So we're just asking for that consideration. Okay, um, let's move on to our next uh, in-house uh, uh, speaker, uh, Chandra Kanamon. Feel free to make that pivot yeah. down. Thank you, I'm a little short here. Yeah. Well, first off, I'd like to say um, the recycling before disposal, that I totally disagree with. And Nakapuna is, you know, no, really, right? I mean, what are we going to do? Going to a museum that's been contaminated before? I mean, that, what kind of history is that that I don't want to share with my children? But I'd like to commend Ernie Lau. You have been my hero from the beginning. And, um, you know, really, it's, I know that this is a military type of functioning where you have all of, you know, Admiral Wade, you know, with your policy questions that you only answer according to because it goes higher up. However, you know, this is the state of Hawaii that we're talking about. This is our home. This is where we get our water. This is our aquifers. Okay. And you folks tapped into our water aquifers. But there's history. There's definite history of the pipelines, right? The pipelines having to be repaired that you just gave us the number 252 repairs over, I don't know how many years, but I know it's definitely older than I am. I'm 66 years old, but I know that the, you know, the, the fuel tanks are older than I am, but you know what? We don't know how much seepage of fuel there was that leaked out of those broken pipelines, as well as the vapor monitoring. Was there vapor monitoring at all done all this time? Or is it only now that we're doing that? Okay, I, I agree with your plans. They are very, very good, okay? As far as the defueling process and the continued you know, remediation. However, I agree with Mr. Lau. Remove the pipes, make sure all nine miles of it is removed properly. No resurrecting something else, using it for other purposes or whatever, because you say too, okay, I got it, <laughs> the timer, yeah. Why out of, okay, you say so far 530 out of 700, um, 7,800 for the two year period that you folks are gonna be testing the waters. Why is it only for two years? It's probably seeped into our soil, right? But the vapor monitoring, the water monitoring, it should go on continuously. With all these people that are getting sick, this is your military people. I spoke about this to a former person. You folks get, you know, moved out every two years. So thank you very much for being here right now. And you're getting the brunt of it from us right now. However, I have talked to another admiral before, and I said, you know what? How much do you respect your people who are fighting for our country by contaminating the water and not taking care of it? It's a shame. It's a real shame, you know? But anyway, I had no, enough. I appreciate it. I just want to clarify. The question is uh, about the vapor. Well, the, well the, the question comes down to is why was DOH2 was so slow in you know reviewing their data? It takes months, months. We, I'm on the neighborhood board and we've been asking for reports on the Red Hill situation. We haven't gotten one since November of 2022. We've asked for the reports. We've asked for the results. And we say, oh, okay, well, you know, the data has to be sent to the mainland for the testing and, you know, and because we don't have labs here. I asked the EPA person that came to our meeting, you know, why is it Hawaii cannot have a special lab put up for this kind of situation? They're working on grants, EP, so I give credit to EPA that Dominique has mentioned that, you know, they're working on a grant to get UH to be a place where the labs. So those are the positive things. So Ernie, you know what? I still think we need to fight this. We just definitely need to keep up the fight with this. 
Okay. Thank, Thank you very you much. much. And then, so uh, if you want to respond to the vapor monitoring, which I think was one of the things you brought up, um, we can move on from there. Say thank you for your feedback. I, I hear you loud and clear. Uh, thank you. And um, so I'll turn it over to Ms. Sarah Moody here to talk about the soil vapor monitoring because that's environmental and that's not in the diffuent. Ma'am, soil vapor monitoring has been going on before right now, and that is going to continue long after closure of the facility. And it is not gonna stop in next year. The two year long-term monitoring program is specifically referring to an agreed upon drinking water program. And that can be reevaluated at that time to see if more drinking water testing is necessary. Okay, um, did you have anything? Yes, sir. Oh, what I would add also is that we're in the process right now of understanding as we move through the JTF and their ability to defuel safely, and transfer that fuel out of there, we're going to then move into this, this phase, what we call that closure. And with that closure under Admiral Barnett, um, we're looking at what is remediation, what is monitoring, what is acceptable and right for the land, for the water. So this is going to continue much longer and expand beyond what I'm doing right now when I'm putting these wells in. Uh, and then we're open to those ideas and what we need to do uh, to make sure that we're monitoring. This is not This is a consumer confidence report on steroids is what we're doing. And it needs to be done that way. And it's and it's absolutely essential. One, that we partner and two, that we um, get it right. And I would add, like to add one more thing. All of the data is available online, 100% of the data. It is directly populated from our environmental data management system to the website. And you can view it through the interactive map versus the groundwater and the drinking water are both available. And Keith, I'm sorry, I'm going to just put a little yep. comment here. Quickly. Mahalo, I totally agree. We cannot stop paying attention to this issue. This is not done when the tanks are empty. This is a decades-long effort and beyond. Mahalo. Okay, thank you. So uh, let's move to our next in-house person. And uh, I would encourage everybody, both when they ask questions and when they respond, if we could uh, try to be as succinct as possible so that we can hear as much information. This is the rare opportunity to have a gathering where you have literally so many people uh, to, to be able to respond. Um, Patricia Beekman. Um, and if you're not here, I'll put a star and come back to you if you're not right here. So um, I will go to uh, Ann Wright, Colonel Ann Wright, I believe. She's gone to, okay, I'm sorry to hear. Um, Jason Alexander, okay. Thank you all for being here. Um, Jason Alexander, settler in Manoa and member of Oahu Water Protectors. Um, I'm just wanting to point out um, some of the inconsistencies in Admiral Wayne's um, statements about his capability to get resources. As you mentioned, you're you're slightly boasting about your rapid response and extending oversight of the facility and such, and yet getting funds for reimbursements, reparations, is a policy matter that you apparently can't influence and didn't care to influence for the several months that this has definitely been on your radar, at least at the last FTAC meeting. The Department of Defense here is paying off a debt for the scourge of violence that has inflicted on this island and its peoples for decades. And any pride in your new badges and such that are celebrating your teamwork and saying that we're all on the same team is not entirely accurate and attempts to whitewash this whole affair into um, this savory narrative. Even though that all the people brought in here may not have been the same people over the past several decades, you're still part of the Department of Defense structure. You're still trying to renew your land leases and you're still not committed to transferring over from this military overstepping of uh, oversight into everyone's lives in this island in the Aina. But um, my main question is why have you not taken the steps to do this policy change, to get the funding, to support all the border wall supplies efforts, to support the registry efforts, to support all this reparations that needs to be done? Why have you not done that? 
Okay, so we'll take that as your question and turn it to the Navy. Hey, sir, thank you for your feedback. And uh, I, I respect your position, but my mission is to safely and expeditiously defuel. And that's what my team and I are completely focused to do. As the senior DOD representative here, I will carry forward the feedback from the community to ensure that the Department of Defense understands the issues, the concerns, and the requests. So you've gotten this feedback before, and you've said that you will carry it forward before. So can you explain what the Department of Defense Lloyd Austin stands is? At the last FTAC, at the last FTAC, there were policy gaps that were identified. We had reservists and National Guards men and women who were not on Title X orders that drank from the water system and got sick and they couldn't get medical care. That feedback went up through the chain of command that night, as I promised. Also, there were civilians that were drinking out of the Navy water distribution system that were sick that could not get reimbursed for care. And that was forwarded up through my chain of command as well. The policy review was conducted and the Department of Defense came out with the Red Hill Clinic uh, and the SECDES that Doc uh, had, had talked about. The reparations that you're asking for and for, uh, and I've written these down, reimbursement for medical and the compensation of people of Hawaii. I heard your feedback. I will push this up through my chain of command, but you're asking me to do something that I don't have authorities to do. That may frustrate you, but that is what it is. My focus is to safely remove the fuel that presents a threat to us today and for future generations. And that's what I'm totally committed to do. And I will also provide your feedback up through the chain of command. I'm committed to do that, sir. I would just note that your position in the military hierarchy places you in this system of violence with the fuel that's already accumulated over the past decades. So it may not be within your complete chain of command authority, but you're in the position you have sitting next to people tasked with environmental remediation. That's not technically a defueling process, is it? So you are in this network of influence and you should be using it and not being proud of simply doing your duty because that's not sufficient. And as we just heard, Red Hill Clinic is basically a sham at this point for how it's been doing things. Okay, thank you. Uh, let's move along now to um, the Zoom feed. And we're gonna call uh, Fiona Robinson. If you could uh, unmute yourself when prompted. Sorry, it does take a few seconds to pull everybody up. Having problems? Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll uh, remember Fiona and get back to her if, uh, if she's having issues. Um, let's go to uh, Melody Aduha online. Fiona, if we missed you and you need to come back in, we'll bring you in uh, next. Okay, yeah, I see she's unmuted now. Oh, here. Okay. I, I'm here. I'm here. Yeah. Sorry about that. Okay. Aloha. My name is Melody Aduha. I'm with the Environmental Caucus of the Democratic Party of Hawaii, which is a semi autonomous organization with a membership of 7,500. Our main concerns focus on safety, risk of fire, efficient emergency response personnel training in the event of spill and fire, and defueling of the remaining 100,000 to 400,000 gallons of flowable tank bottom fuel. The flowable tank bottom fuel will be repacked in the gravity fed pipelines and pump house for a period of 12 to 18 months. We would like to see all the fuel removed from the pipelines and no fuel remains repacked and or stored in the pump house. We do not want to endure another spill, whether it is from the UST or the pipelines, regardless of whether the spill is above the sole source aquifer or not. Any Red Hill fuel spill, regardless of its location along the pipelines, would be harmful to human health and the environment, 
including Pearl Harbor, which has already suffered from nearly a century of petroleum contamination, among other toxins. Under the Hawaiian kingdom, Pearl Harbor, known as Pu'uloa, was a breadbasket, rich in fish, oysters, crustaceans, limu, and other edible marine life. Sadly, today, the minimal marine life that can survive under these toxic conditions remain unfit and poisonous for human consumption. We ask AFTEC, FTEC to oversee the safe defueling relocation and remediation of Red Hill so that its fuel will no longer pose a clear and present danger or cause an imminent and substantial endangerment to human health and the environment from spills above our major drinking water aquifer as well as Pearl Harbor and connecting waterways. Two questions. Question number one, why is the first 63 million gallons of fuel being transported to Par Pacific Island Energy Systems via tanker ships? Why can't the fuel be transported via pipelines from Red Hill to Par Pacific directly? Question two, the Board of Water Supply Quality Report I recently received does not show any PFAS testing. Does the Board of Water Supply test for PFAS in, windward, in the windward system? And will the Board of Water Supply be filing a lawsuit against PFAS manufacturers for their toxic chemical contamination their toxic chemicals contaminating our drinking water wells and its cleanup. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Melody. Uh, if those are the two questions, we'll take your first one. I believe that would be the Navy about the defueling of the 63 million gallons. Yes. Thank you. Okay, thank you for your question. I'm going to uh, actually uh, ask Captain Triggs or General Link. Uh, is Sean, do you know the answer to that question about uh, transferring to PAR via pipelines via, instead of uh, tankers? What's that? Yeah, okay. Okay, so the, uh, the relocation of the fuel is uh, still pre-decisional, uh, which will light, depend on our NEPA, which is the National Environmental Protection Act. So uh, there is possibility that some of the fuel will go to IES, not PAR, IES, which is part of that commercial PAR. Um, other locations that the fuel could be located are fuel depots on the West Coast, and then also uh, uh, other locations in Australia, Singapore, or Japan, and then also redistributed on ships and different nodes out at sea to provide resiliency. So uh, uh, it's premature for me to answer that question. Once we have any more details and judge, do you have, do you have any other feedback for that? Here, come on up here. We can help so I can better answer this question. Okay, um, you're gonna have to take the path around there to get up there easily unless you wanna hop. Can you use that microphone? Oh, I'm sorry, yeah, you're right. Thanks. Yes, As part of our National Environmental uh, Policy Act environmental assessment, we did look at alternatives to sending the, the fuel via tanker. One was the pipeline. And the reason that didn't go forward for full analysis was it was much, much too slow to be able to transfer the fuel via pipeline. And if we did, it would encumber the pipeline so that fuel could not go to other entities such as the airport and other users of fuel that rely on PAR or IES. So for those reasons, it wasn't feasible to send it via pipeline. Okay, thank you. And uh, the second half of the question, I believe if I understand correctly, uh, Melody is uh, to board water supply, correct? Yes, that's correct. Okay, so uh, Ernie Lau. Aloha, Melody. Nice to hear from you. Uh, Aloha. So for, uh, for testing for PFAS, uh, we've been testing for PFAS chemicals, the forever chemicals since 2020. Uh, we haven't found, uh, and keep in mind, everybody, the water quality report that you're receiving right now, our annual water quality report, is basically test results from last year. Uh, so we did not detect any PFAS chemicals in any of our water sources for the windward system. We are testing all of our water sources. Uh, we have uh, detected low levels of PFAS chemicals thus far in seven different well stations. 
uh, all on the leeward side here, on the wind, uh, leeward side of Oahu. Uh, in regards to lawsuit against chemical companies, uh, we anticipate, you know, EPA uh, basically in maybe by the end of the year, finalizing their drinking water regulations for six different PFAS chemicals. And I, I defer to the EPA members if they want to comment on that timeline, but uh, we have, uh, this will be an issue for water utilities across the country. Uh, some utilities or some municipalities have already filed lawsuits. Uh, we, all I want to say at this point, that remains an option uh, to actually go after the chemical companies, some of the large chemical companies that develop these forever chemicals back in the 1940s. Uh, and there are a lot of the versions of these chemicals. Uh, so, Melody, that's an option. I'm not ruling that out, uh, but I'm not saying that we are going to sue at this time, but we are keeping that open. We Board of Water Supply is participating already in a lawsuit against the large petroleum companies over the issue of climate change, along with the city and county of Honolulu and the county of Maui. And that's uh, that case is moving forward and hopefully will stay. And I think it'll stay in the state court system, but we'll keep you updated on what's happening there. Uh, so uh, that's it for BWS. Thank you. Thank, thank, thank you very much. Okay, thank and thank you, Melody. So um, we'll go to the next Zoom uh, participant and then we'll come back to the audience. Uh, I'd like uh, Meredith Wilson to be ready to speak. Oh, that was quick. Thank you. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, loud and clear. Yes, I've been waiting, so I'm ready. <laughs> um, aloha, my name is Meredith Wilson, and I relied on water supplied by Joint Base Pearl Harbor Hickam at my home for five years. Now, like tens of thousands of others, I have to live with the daily dealing of the fact that our water was insidiously poisoning us and continues to cause some seen and unforeseen havoc amongst this community. The very thing that was supposed to hydrate us during those once in a lifetime Oahu hikes, the sprinkler we turned on for our kids to get out and enjoy the Hawaii sunshine, the bowl we filled thinking we were keeping our loving pets healthy. All of these innocent, seemingly insignificant actions were stolen from us. We no longer do any of these things the same due to the in inaction of, of many of the people who are here and are not here. So to the DOD leadership, at this time, I direct these questions. One, as recent as April 27th, less than two months ago, an address in my previous neighborhood measured 67.3 parts per billion TPHD. How do you explain that this is not a JP5 or jet fuel related detection? We have heard that there is a different fingerprinting rationale, but please explain this further. Feel free to use technical terms, we can handle it. Two, as an outline duty for the fuel tank advisory committee, DLA especially should be considering the short and long-term effects from this exposure. What is the Navy doing other than establishing the registry to accomplish this? The CDC ATSDR study is an ancillary of effort. What has DLA studied and collected thus far if they didn't even open their clinic to virtual appointments to off-island affected people? How can a total picture of the outcomes be collected this way? And now for the Hawaii Department of Health, I'd appreciate answers to the following. One, why has there not been a response from the state's toxicologist, Diana Felton, or chief of the Safe Drinking Water Branch, Dennis Lopez, after the now four-month-old February 2nd memo written by Dr. Roger Brewer regarding the estimates of contaminants and concentrations, including most notably antifreeze, from the November 2021 spill? Surely these res revelations would spark some thoughts or guidelines that either of them could share with the public. And two, finally, Dr. Roger Brewer mentioned at the previous EPA Red Hill and Focus webinar that we can expect an EAL for TPH and all types of fuel update by the end of this month. Is that still on track? And should the EAL change, will the screening levels for long-term monitoring be reflected appropriately? Mahalo for everyone continuing to keep this at the top of mind and realizing that there is, like BWS always says, no substitute for pure water. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Meredith. And uh, we've got basically four questions. We'll try to get to them. So uh, it'll be the first one is for the Navy. And uh, if you could take that, please. Yes, sir. We have the first question. Thank you, Meredith. So uh, 
just like you have looked through the data and have noticed that there are results that have low level detections of TPH, we've done the same. I have a team of drinking water experts that work every day on this project and they look through the data as it comes in every single day. And when we started to see some of these results, we wanted to verify that it was not related to JP5. And so what the laboratory does is they create chromatograms, which basically track the signature of the result that we have and compare it to the signature of a known JP5 sample to be able to compare the two to see if it is indeed JP5. And in all of these samples that we have had with low level detections, none of them have registered and matched the chromatogram as JP5. And so we do continue to look at this. Many of them are within the realm of what we call noise, which means the laboratory, it's such a low level detection that it could be algae, it could be organic matter, it could be something else in the petroleum carbon chain. And so we just continue to watch these results closely to make sure we don't see a trend change or any indication that there's a change in our distribution system. Okay, I believe uh, the next set of questions was uh, for Department of Health. Yes, we're going to ask Roger Brewer to come forward to answer the questions. Okay, so uh, Roger Brewer is coming out, getting mic. Give him just a minute here. Yeah, I think I think I heard the question. You're asking you, when the, this way. No, so you. you. You're asking when the action level that we published for total petroleum hydrocarbons would be updated. So we've been working on that. It's we're still waiting for data from a laboratory that's doing more detailed analysis of the fuel. I'm starting to get the results in. I just started getting in last week. So that I was hoping to have something done by the end of this month, but it may take a little bit longer. So it's it's still pending, but it's on the way. Okay. And uh, were there any follow-ups to that? Um, otherwise, we'll go back to the audience in the house. There was okay. a question to about the the Red Hill Clinic about if they were doing any other studies. Okay, so um, we'll uh, allow Dr. Rice, I believe, to maybe address that and then we'll, we'll move on. Thank you very much. Yeah, uh, thank you. Oh, face sorry. Um, so you're, you're asking if, if we're doing more studies uh, Further than what the ATSDR is looking at now, am I clearing that question? Yes, is the I, I guess you there was a mentioning earlier that you've um, requested for and maybe gotten approval for a third party registry. Is that outside of the typical Deers registry or Doors registry? Um, yeah. And is that like is that similar to the Flint, Michigan registry where it's um, going to follow us throughout our lifetimes? Yes, that's a great question. Thank you. So, so um, yeah, the doors registry uh, is is basically a list of who was exposed to our military related uh, it, it, from the field exposure. The independent third party registry that has been approved um, will include everyone exposed, uh, civilians. Um, you know, inside and outside and related to the military and, and active duty, of, of course, and family members. So um, that registry will have much more functionality to it. And it will be something that will, will be there for your lifetime and be able to be used for ongoing research in the future. Okay. Thank you very much, Meredith, for the questions. Um, we're going to go back to the uh, in-house audience. Uh, and before we do, um, just know we are obviously a little over time uh, and in fairness, because the speakers here went over time in the beginning, um, we'll hang on for a bit more uh, so we can take more questions. But I would highly encourage everybody if you could just you know try to be very succinct and direct uh, so that we can get as many in as possible. Um, I'd, I'd like, like to, to call on Eric Lenko. Yeah, you probably want to push that microphone down a bit there. Alan, I can see something regarding our drinking water 
It says implement a long term drinking water monitoring plan. How long do you plan to be here in Hawaii when you know the Navy lease is up in 2029? Very direct question. Thank you for being so direct. Um, Care to respond? For, thank you for that question. I appreciate it. I'll tell you that um, the, the Navy in the beautiful state of Hawaii, we have a long relationship. Our goal, our goal, the folks sitting here and a lot of folks that aren't here, we're here to, we're here to fix the wrong. We want to protect the environment. We want to take care of public health. All the folks sitting up here, young man, we're here to get that right. Uh, there are some things that were done wrong in the past, and we're looking forward to, uh, through action indeed, uh, being good stewards. Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna drain Red Hill and we're gonna close it. Okay. I want a clean water, clean sea water for me and my children. Yes, sir. Okay. But I don't believe you actually answered the question. How long do you plan to be here? Ma'am, right now, our focus, the folks here, our focus is to take care of getting the fuel out of Red Hill. We're going to be here as long as that takes and for closure, ma'am. We're in the remediation process, as we've talked about, and that's going to go on for quite a long time. Uh, as far as the leases, that's out of my scope right here, along with the folks sitting here. But um, our job is to take care of the environment, get rail get the fuel out of radio and, and I'll close it down. Okay. So my comments were regarding this committee oversight, civilian oversight committee. And so I have questions, I guess we can do question answer. Uh, number one, it says that, what are the defueling requirements in the 2023 consent order? Number six says, relocate the fuel to various locations. I know you kind of touched upon the other one, but it's very vague. Where are these actual various locations? So just to clarify, you're referring to the uh, community representation uh, initiative that was yes. discussed earlier? Okay, thank you. So I have questions. There's yeah. just a few questions there. Okay. So that's one. Um, yeah, well, uh, Amy, would you like to, Amy Miller from the EPA? I'm sorry, so can you repeat the question? Re relocating the fuel to various locations. So I just want clarification. In other words, my questions today regarding this, which is part of the defueling plan, where are the various locations for the fuel to be stored? Number six. So the, uh, the question is, where will the fuel go um, after it's defueled? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, are you, so you're looking at this community representation initiative that has the things that that initiative will look at. One of them is the relocation of the fuel. Right. Okay. It's part of the yes, consent order. Thank you. It's number six. Right. So so the re again the relocation of the fuel is still uh, pre decisional. Uh, it will be redistributed amongst uh, potential locations that I described before, either uh, several uh, fuel depots on the West Coast of the United States, uh, perhaps uh, at IES, which is on the Western, or uh, on the West side of Oahu, uh, and then uh, perhaps in other countries, Australia, Japan, Singapore, and then also for points uh, afloat. That decision will be made here very, very shortly. As we talked about earlier, the decision point for the tankers is coming up here in about a month. And then depending on the NEPA review, we'll determine where the fuel will go. Okay, and then it says, what are the closure requirements in the 2023 consent order? And it has a short paragraph here, and it says there are two phases for closure. For phase one closure, Navy and DLA shall submit interim closure reports within 30 days of when one or more of the 20 USTs, pipelines, or surge tanks are closed. So how long do you guesstimate that will take? Because within 30 days, when 
these things mentioned are closed, how long will that take? So I'm just thinking ahead if it's gonna be extended and extended, if it's vague for a reason. It takes about four months, we're estimating four months per tank uh, for the cleaning after that. And then how much longer do you think? Right, and yeah, then we'll follow, the, the we'll follow the consent order as, there, as directed by EPA. Okay, and it says phase two closure may be, a, oh, sorry, go ahead. And if, if we could uh, okay. move on to another, but I, I would like to remind everybody that um, uh, the CRI that you're referring to, that community um, representation initiative, there's going to be a webinar on that. That's a chance also to ask questions as well as you know meetings after. So this yes. is sort of new. I don't want to yeah, take sorry. That. Yeah, this is the consent order, and this other one is the committee. Sorry. Okay. But, uh, but, okay. but basically, I would just be specify like you know how many pages for the phase two closure. If you take a look at this later, how many pages is it for us to read, and where can we find it? Uh, that 2015. Red Hill Administrative Order and Consent, because it says phase two closure may be addressed under the 2023 consent order or by the 2015 Red Hill Administrative Order and Consent or <laughs> another EPA approved enforcement, enforcement instrument. So all are these all means of saying like you actually don't know yet or you do know for phase two? I'll take that question. Um, so the document you have there is the fact sheet about the consent order and what it covers. And you were asking questions about the closure, and there's there's two parts of closure. One is actually closing the tanks in the pipe at, at the facility, and then there's the long-term remediation that needs to be done. Currently, EPA is working under the 2015 order on consent with the Department of Health to do that remediation work. Should, should things change, we have the capability of doing remediation under the 2023 order, um, or we could come up with another mechanism. What we are trying to capture here is that EPA has oversight authority over remediation. Um, we have two different agreements right now, the 2015 and the 2023. Uh, in the future, we may decide to consolidate it under one. Um, it, we just wanted to be clear um, with you all that we have options and, and that's described in the consent order. And our documents are on, on the web and we have a webinar coming up on Tuesday um, where we will call, uh, talk about this in detail and answer any uh, questions about it. Thank you. Great. And there's just one really quick short uh, question. I'm sorry, we're really, you know, in fairness to the others who have waited here too. But I just wanted to say, you know, we this is an ongoing over 50 years or so that these leaks and, you know, you're given unlimited time. I just wanted to just be able to say this because I've been in Zoom meetings, been in the town halls, hearing the same answer. And I don't mind, you know, listening to everybody's input he came on out, and I just have this one last question, and then the statement. It's a short one. Okay, the kickoff please. and scoping meeting for the com committee, the civilian committee. It says location and more details to come. By when? How often should we be checking back within this month? Because the kickoff and scoping meeting is July twenty seventh. Um, we just determined that date last week of July 27th, and we plan to get the information out as quickly as possible. We will um, be be doing um, media and and blasts out to get the that information out wide and broadly. Uh, and uh, one way that that you can learn um, about the more details is join our email group where information is passed, uh, you know, is, is, is given out via email. Okay, thank you very much. Let's move to uh, Tara Rojas. That's me, that was, so I was actually- Oh, behind. okay, thank, sorry. thank you, Tara. I didn't realize that, I'm, I'm sorry, I, uh, okay. Let's move to the next yeah. speaker then, but, Noel Shaw. So that was actually so then. Well, this, that, that was actually about six or seven minutes between the two of you. Okay. So it's it's really so this is really this last part, just a statement. It's not a question. It's not a question. Just I want you to know that Amoko Keave, what's happening right now with the PGV and the destabilization of the Aina there, 
you know, the bombing of Pohakuloa. So these are things that maybe you think it's not related, but it's all connected because if there is, we're just one earthquake away from a, a super big emergency. If the aina slides, slips into the ocean, that's super close the tidal wave and also we're one earthquake away and nine years, two years, three years that we're still looking for data. I mean, you had enough time to look up data, at least give the old data before new techniques are, you know, created. And then also to have your higher ups here, you know, for process questions to be prepared. These community meetings are gonna be almost every month, maybe every other month, but we don't wanna be coming every other month and be hearing the same thing. So when, again, I'm gonna say it again, when can your commander be here to answer this process question? Because also one last thing, the water. Well, okay, if you, it, I'm sorry, I'm gonna to have to, it's There's just a straight too much right at this point. So We're going on like more like eight minutes yeah. and there are people waiting. I yeah, really you. respect that you did, you, you had a chance to ask as many questions, but in all fairness, I would like to go back to the Zoom at this point. Thank you very much for Thank your, you. so just your time. Our water. Okay. Uh, I'd like to call Candice uh, Fujikani, um, if you're still online. Hi, it takes a long time to get on. Um, Aloha, my coffee. Yes. My name's Candice you're, Fujikani. You're, you're loud and clear. Okay, good. So I wanted to reiterate what Marty Townsend said about the importance we want to decommission the tanks, do not repurpose them for any use. My question is, it's my understanding that the environmental assessment will be released this Friday. Is that correct? For the defueling? Okay, let's take that one first because uh, that's a direct well, That's question. not a question. Uh, it's just an affirmation. I'll just go on then. If it's right, being released this Friday, if it's being released this Friday, how long does the public have to respond to the environmental assessment of defueling? Because I understand the need to facilitate the process. There's an urgency here, but I want to be sure that the defueling process itself is safe because there's a great risk of spillage at the point of defueling. Okay, so um, got that, sir. Thank you so much. Uh, so, yes, the uh, environmental assessment for the relocation of the fuel uh, will be released this week. It's 21 days. Uh, for review. There will also be a public meeting, I believe, on the 15th, uh, and uh, that has been advertised, and the information on that is also on our website and uh, also on our app. Uh, we assess that the environmental assessment should have no impact on our timeline. Again, we are aiming towards the start of defueling on 16, 16 October, uh, originally, the start was in February. We've been able to work with all the stakeholders to, to move that timeline up. That is important to all of us because this is a threat to human health and the environment, and that's what we're doing and focused on every day to shorten that timeline, but to do it safely. Okay, thank, thank you. you very much. Um, so my second um, question Unless is, there's something really specific, we only have yes. four more. Yes, my second question is, can you give us the specific information about the date, the time, and the place? for that meeting on the EA. So you said it was July 15th. Where will that meeting be and what time? Give me, give me a second. Let me go on the app and I'll get you the information here in one second. I don't have it memorized. It's June 15th. It's June yeah. 15th. I'm sorry, June 15th. You're right. June 15th, but... Okay. Okay, hey, Lagoon at four o'clock in the afternoon. Okay, thank you. And if, welcome, you, if you go onto that uh, EPA calendar, you'll see the, I believe you'll see the information there. Uh, yeah, so, I, I was just surprised uh, that that hasn't come up as a topic for discussion, but that's okay. We'll, we'll talk about it on the 15th. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, let's go to uh, Lacey Quintero. Appreciate everybody's patience for Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, um, I'll try to be quick. I know there's people waiting. Um, Thank you. So I just, as a Red Hill affected family, I wanted to provide a comment on why we are not going to the Red Hill Clinic. Um, 
And then I have two questions that are related to the Red Hill Clinic. Um, so just in general, uh, I wanna give you an experience of a family that went to the Red Hill Clinic without giving their names. This person is a very close friend of mine. Her kids are the same age as mine. And so I looked to her when she told me that she was going to the clinic to see what her experience was before I decided whether I wanted to go. So when she reported back to me what happened, I, my decision was made to not go. And this is what happened. And this is early in the process. I understand things have changed, but everybody needs to understand why we're not going, okay? Um, she called into the TRICARE nurse advice line and then she spent eight hours on the telephone giving a two hour per person in her family medical history before she could even make an appointment. Eight hours on the phone. When she did get an appointment, um, she was seen at the clinic with her and her daughter and this resulted in no referrals for her daughter, which is why she really cared, right? We care about our kids more than we do ourselves. So she had no referral for her daughter, which is why she was there. Um, now she was referred back to Tripler, which is the, the doctors who had initially treated her and dismissed her. So to go through all of these hoops, she essentially ended back at square one. So I hope you all can understand why none of us wanna continue to be gaslit by the same doctors who believe nothing is ongoing for us. Um, so that's one reason. Second, um, for me personally, I will never trust a military medical doctor ever again for the rest of my life. And my children will never see a military medical doctor ever. I don't care what I have to do. We are currently still waiting to see an endocrinologist. The soonest available appointment was September of this coming year. We've been waiting now forever because there's only two on the island. Okay, so that's kind of struggles we're dealing with. I'm sure you're all familiar with healthcare struggles on this island and how long the wait lists are and all that. So I won't go into that, but um, know that we're still here and we want care and we're still not getting what we want. Um, the people who have moved off island, we're all trying to leave. Some of us can't yet, but we're trying to make plans to leave. Um, for the people who have left, some of them wanna to go to the clinic, but there's no virtual option to attend. So that's question number one, moving into my question. Why isn't there a virtual option to go see this clinic? Two, why are, why are there no referrals to civilian doctors? Those are the ones we would trust over tripler doctors. Thank you. Okay, so let's take those two questions. One is uh, virtual uh, referrals or virtual consults and referrals to local doctors, non-military. Um, Dr. Rose? Again, face this way. Okay, thank you. Man, thank, thank you for sharing that. And, and I truly am sorry that that was the experience that, uh, that, that you're having and that your, your, your friend also, also had. Um, so, so with respect to virtual um, appointments at the Red Hill Clinic. Um, you know, so, so this is a, um, a clinic that is a, a, a DHA region Indo-Pacific initiative. And, and so it, 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 it is intended to serve the, the, the population here that falls under the Indo-Pacific region. Um, the, there, there is a, Plenty of capacity of care uh, when you get to the, to the uh, mainland, and um, uh, we're making uh, lots of efforts to uh, make sure that providers are, are aware of the Red Hill uh, uh, situation here and, uh, and to, to care for patients uh, appropriately uh, from, from there. And one thing that I, 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 uh, I misunderstood Dr. Lauser earlier question uh, that I should clarify that um, if, if you're in the doors registry, which if, if you were here when the, the fuel spill happened, you, you are in that, uh, in that registry, your, your, your medical record is, uh, has, a, has a flag on it that says that you are part of that population. So the, the, 
doctors you see when you go to the mainland will, will have that uh, uh, notification up front. They may ask you more questions about it, mind you. Um, and uh, also when you get to the mainland, there's, there's a, um, you know, a, a wealth of uh, pu public health infrastructure to assist those providers that, that, that see you there. Um, um, so uh, what, your other question was, um, oh, so, referrals to civilian doctors. Yeah, thank you. Um, so, so if I if I could clarify, you're you're asking why doctors here at Tripler don't refer you to civilian specialists? I believe that's what she asked. Correct. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I'm um, asking why you why these families are being expected to go to the Red Hill Clinic just to be referred back to Tripler, which is where they couldn't get care in the first place. It's just like inserting an unnecessary step to get back to the same point and the same doctors. Okay. Um, well, uh, yeah, yeah, I, I understand that that, that frustration. Um, uh, the, the, the Red Hill Clinic is, is um, uh, should, should act as an avenue to get you to um, ongoing care for someone who is knowledgeable uh, about the fuel spill, but also get you to specialty care expeditiously um, uh, to, to specialists that are also knowledgeable of, of, the, of the fuel spill. Uh, and uh, I, I could I could sympathize with you that that kind of feels like a circular uh, motion, but um, uh, uh, you know if if your uh, concern is that you're feeling that when you do see a civilian health uh, excuse me when you see a military health system specialist and you're not getting what you need. Um, well, I, I, I advise you to go see the uh, uh, patient advocate and share that with the patient advocate and, and uh, see what options are available uh, to you there. Because in, in our system, you, you are entitled to second opinions, and uh, that may be what you need to ask for. Okay, thank you. Let's um, move on to our next uh, Zoom uh, questionnaire. We have just a few more people signed up to ask questions and, and we can only really take a few more. Uh, so I'm gonna call upon, and I, again, I urge you to be uh, as brief as you possibly can while be, being direct. Uh, Richard Rochelle. Hello, this is Richard. Um, I sent you a message back saying that I cede my time to others. So please give it to them. Oh, okay. I, if, if we can do that, if, uh, if that's what you prefer. Thank you. Don't cut them off. Bye. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, so uh, let's go to Amanda Feint. And then we're going to, uh, at that point, after Am Amanda uh, speaks, then we'll come back to the Zoom audience, excuse me, the in-person audience, and then we'll close. Uh, so Amanda? Um, Are you able to hear me? Yes, we can. Hi, yes, I have two questions. Last week, I did my fifth congressional trip back in DC, where I met with many congressional leaders, two of which from the Hawaii delegation. We spoke specifically about um, the Red Hill Clinic, and they wanted to know why many of us were not going. And so I was very candid about that. Um, they were also very concerned to learn that uh, virtual appointments had been briefed to them as an option for all of us who have moved off island. Um, can you explain where the disconnect is, why Congress is being briefed, that that option is available to all of us when it is indeed not? My second question is, and I don't know if it's been briefed, um, is that we've been in communications obviously with the Department of Health um, we know that the EPA has reassessed the toxicity level of TPH as of roughly September of 2022, and that the DOH is, if they have not done so already, is um, going to be reevaluating the TPH exceedance level from 266 parts per billion 
to roughly 95 parts per billion. Can you, can someone there confirm when this will be released and how the military plans to change their narrative in saying that the water is absolutely safe when there are documents now that clearly exceed 95 parts per billion um, when you're with your long-term medical monitoring, or excuse me, long-term water monitoring. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So the first question is back to uh, the uh, uh, DHA, and then the second question will go to Department of Health. Uh, ma'am, ma'am, I'm sorry that there there is that, that disconnect uh, that you explained, but I I cannot explain why there is the disconnect. There is there the Redwood Clinic does not offer virtual care. Okay, can you uh, explain the, why that is being to goes, Congress? I, I'm sorry, I, I part of the I, NDAA. I guess he know how to answer. Part of the NDA 2023 requires you all to brief Congress um, on these things, specifically the Red Hill Clinic now. So can you explain who it is that is briefing Congress on this information that is clearly inaccurate? Okay, I don't know if you can answer that, uh, but that would be the question. Okay, and then we'll, we'll go to the second part, which is Department of Health. I could just take take the question up to- Yeah, Ms. Ms. Fine, this is Dharma Wade. Um, clearly this is an issue. And as the senior representative from DOD, I will personally take this on. Uh, we brief the Department of Defense monthly. And when I say we, the collective group here, uh, 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 and also our chain of command, uh, Doc Frick does not do it. It's uh, Major General Heck. So I'll talk with him personally tomorrow. We'll figure out what's going on and, and we'll, we'll square this away. Okay. okay, and the second part of the question was for, uh, for DOH with respect to the, uh, the uh, EALs. Call on Roger Brewer. Roger, if you can come back up here again. Just give us a second here. Uh, somebody's coming up to the mic. Did you hear the question, Roger? Uh, can you repeat the question? Okay, Amanda, could you just repeat that second part of the question you had about the EALs, please? Certainly. Hi, Dr. Brewer. Um, this question is specifically about the EPA's reassessment of the TPH toxicity levels that they produce at the Navy and obviously DOH has been aware of since roughly September of 2022. Um, also tracking and aware that this would change the TPH level from approximately 266 parts per billion to potentially 95 parts per billion. Um, when is that information being released to the public? And what is the Navy's response in their narrative? The water is absolutely safe when we have seen the long-term monitoring of water be above 95 parts per billion um, over the past year. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so, we, so we're discussing the, the updates with the EPA at this moment. As I mentioned before, the previous questioner, we initially planned to have some updates done by the end of the month. I'm also doing laboratory tests on the JP5 tool from Red Hill. I just started receiving that data last week. But as far as the updates, like I said, they're, they're pending. And it may not be the end of this month, but it's definitely on the way. Okay. okay. As far and as maybe month, this maybe question really, Dr. Brewer, thank you. The question really is that it's kind of two part, right? So I understand where DA, DOH's stance is, but really the military's response to continuing to tell the public that the water is absolutely safe and that there is no fuel in the water. Um, when clearly the EPA has looked at this and published this for almost a year now, saying that the, you know, what they thought before about TPH, the toxicity level has obviously been more. And so when we have water test results that are above 95 parts per billion, how can the Navy continue to tell the public, its residents and its newcomers, the water is absolutely safe when the EPA has okay. determined That's that it's actually more toxic Navy, than yeah. we originally thought? That's a question for the you, Navy. Yes, okay. Um, if you care to respond, and then we'll move on, Amanda, after that. Thank you. Thank you, okay, sir. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you for the question. I'll tell you that we, are, uh, we as a Navy, we're working in partnership with the regulators 
with the EPA and DOH on our water source. And we will uh, continue to partner and collaborate with them on the way ahead. But right now we're following uh, the direction and the guidance from the, uh, from the regulators. Okay, I'm gonna come back to the audience here for the last two. Uh, so thank you for uh, all your patience. Uh, Noel Shaw, are you in the audience? Yeah, I guess Noel is, oh, sorry, okay. Aloha, I'm gonna try and keep these two yes or no questions. So when I ask a question, if you could ask her yes or no, I'd appreciate it. The first question is, who on this stage has a genealogical tie to a land base, water resources, natural resources, mo'olelo, stories, or a place? A genealogical tie to a place. I think I'll stop. Any of you? I do. Haleo has. We do in Hawaii. I, I don't understand your question. You don't <laughs> understand the question. That's the problem, sir. And that's important, important that, that you acknowledge, acknowledge that you don't understand that question. You don't see me often here because it's hard for me to come. Look, you watched this whole time, the two hours I was here. It is difficult for me to be here because I have a genealogical tie to this place. That means my children have. It means my ancestors have been here from generations to generations to generations. Are you all here garnering generational wealth? by sitting on the stage, AKA, are you earning money? Yes or no? We are here to remove the fuel. Do you earn money doing that way? Allow him to have Please. a response. Okay. Thank you. I think you and I, and, and many of us here have a lot in common that we agree that we need to remove the fuel from this facility. It's a threat to us today, and to the future generations that you have presented and those that will come after. We have been assigned to this mission to remove the fuel and then to close this facility down. And that is our absolute commitment to you and the rest of this community. I understand that. You've repeated that many times. I need to teach you right now that generational wealth in Hawaii is water. Is the ability to keep, keep being able to live here from generation to generation to generation. And to gain, garner our wellness, Department of Health, from our connection to this place. I'm telling you this now on this date because I'm able to be here now. Right? There's tons of me. At one time, there are 40,000 Native Hawaiians. Now there are 600,000 Native Hawaiians. We are here because our ancestors maintain a generational connection to this place because we had clean water. If we do not have that, we will not be here as Native Hawaiians. I'm telling you this because it's a mental health implication, Department of Health. When I name my children after their grandparents who are named after rain, who are named after moon elements, who are named after safety, I am tethering them to Hawaii because I know Hawaii will keep them safe. I cannot promise them that when you continue to be here. And I have to watch you all and keep you all accountable while I watch them. So when you're thinking about who am I accountable to when you're doing this work, and you can clock in and out or you go to sleep. I know, I know you take homework with you. I know it doesn't end. Remember my face. Remember my children's faces and remember that I come with 40,000, 400,000 behind me and 400,000 ahead of me and 400,000 alongside me. Plus, the world knows and they're watching. Mahalo. Thank you. Um, and uh, our last speaker then will be uh, Garner Shimuji. Thanks for the opportunity, um, hard to follow that, but um, I just wanna give a shout out to um, Jamie and Meredith, military families who are affected. Uh, I can't imagine, I cannot imagine having children affected like that. And um, I really pray that uh, DOD 
policymakers can get their act straight and uh, not hide behind. And I, I, don't, I don't mean to say that in a demeaning way, but uh, go behind studies and analysis, but uh, reach out to these people personally, find out what's the problem and, and take action immediately because time is of the essence for these families and their health. Um, that's a comment that I have. Um, thank you, Admiral Wade, for your um, heart to serve. I know you didn't, um, you inherited this problem and you're doing your best. I wanna thank all of you for your efforts. Uh, pray for our water protection, pray for the plans to defuse to go smoothly. A question I have is regarding the pipeline. Um, you stated that uh, after the defueling of the tanks via the gravity, there may be approximately 100,000 gallons uh, remaining in the pipeline. Um, question was, the remaining fuel in the pipeline, what kind of threat does it still, uh, what kind of threat is it to the aquifer? Um, and is there a projected timeline for the removal of that fuel. And I understand, or I thought I heard you say that you did empty the pipeline approximately 100 million gallons for repairs. So if it's still in that uh, excavated state, are there other um, you know, corrections that you can do to prepare for this evacuation? Um, and lastly, are there, is there technology to see in the pipes where there's remaining fuel so that you can uh, expeditiously and safely uh, defuel every last drop? Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for the question. Um, so, first of all, uh, there's the estimate is about 100 to 400,000 gallons that will remain after we gravity to fuel. If you, if you have a sink in your kitchen um, and you look at the, you know, the pipe that bends and if you were to take it out, there's gonna be water in that bend, it's the same thing. And we've got low point drains throughout the facility. Uh, so we, we have to meticulously get after that after we do the gravity draining. We are in the process right now of doing a survey with lasers, with precise data to understand where fuel may be when we complete the gravity draining. But for full transparency, you can't x-ray. We, we, we have to locate that fuel and methodically go through based on the information from these surveys. So once the survey is complete, we're gonna do what we call mission analysis to then come up with the plan that we then need to work with the regulators to get approval to get after every last drop. But let me just be clear to repeat again for everyone here and on Zoom, the Department of Defense is committed to get every last drop out of this facility. That is the Secretary of Defense's commitment to all of you here. It's the right thing to do for the people of Hawaii, our military families, the environment. And, 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 and so we have to put together though another plan. And so you asked, is there a timeline? There isn't a timeline, okay? There, and I'm just being truthful because it all depends on where and, and where we find these pockets. I explained just one valve. And because we took meticulous care we had primary and secondary containments. We had to take care of the asbestos and the lead. It took us 13, 14 weeks, but we got it. We did it without incident. And that's what we need to do. So I thank you for your feedback. We will continue to work this aggressively. I thank all of you for the feedback that you've given us. And um, our commitment is to do our very, very best each and every day. So thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, uh, so Keith, I, would, I would just like to ask the chair if you would like to make any closing comments. Use your mic, please. 
Thank you everyone for your comments and for attending and we will take all the comments back and uh, and do and give it its the appropriate amount of attention. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. We really appreciate it and safe drive home. Um, stay tuned. Aloha. I have a quick follow-up question to, to that question about the leaks though. Can I ask it? I was signed up for the Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, we're the, we're, we're kind of done with the Zoom and everything. Okay, yes. <laughs>